Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Welcome back to the 375th episode of Thought Behind Things. Today is the 20th of October 2023. And today we have a very special guest with us. When I was originally invited, I thought that when we talk about health care, we don't know if there are so many viewership or not. We don't know if there are so many people interested in it or not. But we are talking about this. It is an institution in Pakistan, something that has been developed, which is on global standards, not only on the standards, but on the standards. آج ہمارے ساتھ موجود ہیں چیف میڈیکل آفیسر آف شوکت خانم میموریل ہاسپٹل اور شوکت خانم کینسر ہاسپٹل ڈاکٹر آسم یوسف میں یہاں پر یہ مینشن کرنا چاہوں گا دیکھیں جی اس ہاسپٹل کا ایک کنیکشن رہا ہے عمران خان صاحب کے ساتھ اور عمران خان صاحب کی ایک پرٹیکل پولیٹیکل ہسٹری رہی ہے پلیز اس کانورسیزیشن کو سنتے ہوئے آپ پالیٹکس کو نہ لے کر آئیں درمیان میں چاہے فار پرو اور اگینسٹ اس کانورسیزیشن کو اس انسٹیٹیوٹ کے میرٹ کے لیے سنیے گا اور خاص کر اس میں ہم نے میں نے پرسنلی آئی ہیو اوائڈڈ اینی پالیٹکس اور پولیٹیکل کانورسیشن آئی ہیو ٹرائی ٹو ان پیک دس انسٹیٹیوشن بیکاز اٹ از موسٹ سرٹنلی اے جیول ان پاکستان کراؤن اینڈ آئی تھنک اٹ ووڈ بی اے ڈس سروس ٹو ایسوسیٹ پالیٹکس ود دس انسٹیٹیوشن ڈاکٹر آسم یوسف صاحب پرسنلی جو مجھے مزہ آیا ان سے بات کر کے دا وے دیٹ ہی اسپیکس دا وے دیٹ از مطلب ان کا جو 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 طرز ہے بات کرنے کا پرسنلی آپ کو بہت مزہ آئے گا مور دین دیٹ اوبیسلی دا اسٹوریز آر انکریڈیبل ہی از بن ایسوسیٹیڈ ود دی انسٹیٹیوٹ فار تھرٹی ایئرز اینڈ ہیز بن انسٹرومینٹل ان اسکیلنگ اٹ اپ ایز ویل اگر آپ اس چینل پہ نئے ہیں تو سبسکرائب کرنا مت بھولیے گا اگر آپ پرانے ہیں تو ویڈیو کو لائک کرنا مت بھولیے گا اس سے ہمارے الگریزم کو بڑا فائدہ ہوتا ہے اگر آپ کے کوئی تھاٹس ہیں تو کامنٹ سیکشن میں ضرور آ کے بتائیں آئی لسن ٹو آل آف دیم آئی ریڈ آل آف دیم اینڈ اٹ ریلی ہیلپ می امپروو دا کوالٹی آف کانورزیشن اگر آپ اوورسیز پاکستانی ہیں تو نیچے دی گئی ہوئی لنک کے اوپر آپ ہمیں سپورٹ کر سکتے ہیں ٹو ہیلپ اس اسٹے انڈیپینڈنٹ فار ایز لانگ ایز پاسبل بٹ اینی ویز دس از ڈاکٹر آسم یوسف آن ٹی بی ٹی اسلام آباد اسٹوڈیو آسم صاحب کیسے ہیں آپ بالکل ٹھیک میں کانورسیشن کو تھوڑا سا اسٹارٹ کروں گا جسٹ ٹرائنگ ٹو انڈرسٹینڈ لیٹل بیٹ اباؤٹ وے وی یو بورن این ارلی لائف آپ نے کہاں پہ گزاری سو آئی از بورن ان لنڈن نائنٹین سکسٹی ٹو آئی ایم کلوز ٹو سکسٹی ٹو ایئرس اولڈ جنوری میں اینڈ آئی لیو دیر آئی واز نیئرلی ففٹین ایٹ وچ ٹائم مائی مدر ان دس آئی تھنک ان دا مڈ سیونٹیز مسٹر بھٹو دا پرائم منسٹر ران دس ایگزام فار پیپل فرام اوور سیز ٹو جوائن دا پاکستانی سول سروس So my mother was an ardent Pakistani and never wanted to live in England. All my life I grew up hearing about, you know, um, we're going to go back to Pakistan, this and that. And my dad never wanted to come back to Pakistan. So she gave the exam, she got into the civil service, and in late 1976, I think, she came back to Pakistan and I joined her a little later. Right. Went to school in Pindi for a year, St. Mary's, great school. And then uh, had no real... aim in life and <laughs> didn't really know what to do. So I wanted to join the Pakistan Air Force and be a fighter pilot, like yeah, I think every 15, 16 year old <laughs> boy does. And my mother was greatly opposed to the idea. And then one day she comes home and says, yeah, okay, you can go and check it out. So I went to the selection center on uh, Namal in Pindi to be told that, no, you have to be at least 16 to join. And I wasn't quite 16. And I'm sure my mother had found, out, found this out before she <laughs> allowed me to go. So then I went to government college, did FSC, and my mother thought I should be a doctor, and I didn't really know what else I should do. So that's how I ended up going to medical school, which probably isn't terribly inspiring for future physicians. <laughs> <laughs> But in the late 70s, that's how it was. You know, you did yeah. medicine or you did engineering or, you know, you were considered a failure in life, I think. And what medical school did you go to? So, so we lived in Islamabad, mm -hmm. and uh, I really didn't want to live in a hostel. I was quite happy to go to Pindi Medical College, but my mother had relatives and so on who had been to the famous King Edward Medical College in Lahore, and you know that was the be-all and end-all as far as they were all concerned. So again, my mother thought I should go to King Edward, and I said, okay, I'll go, but then you need to get yourself transferred to Lahore, get a civil service job in Lahore so I can live at home, because I'm not living in the hostel. So that's what I did. I went to King Edward. And did she end up moving to Lahore for She you? did, yes. Um, to sidetrack a little, I'd had a, a bizarre experience in the hostel in government college because uh, I was in the hostel there for a year. Um, I'd come back to Pakistan a year before that, roughly. Didn't really speak very much Urdu and spoke no Punjabi at the time. And uh, when I went to the hostel, my first night in the hostel, I was a reception party that came to greet me. 
And uh, at that time in government college, all the kids in the hostel were people who had topped the various metric boards from all over the Punjab. Right. And that's how they measured one another. They assessed one another. You know, how many marks did you get in the metric? And I got more than you. So they, the first question when I opened the door was, ke, oh, where are you from or whatever? And then ke, in Punjabi, the guy says, Kine number tere aisan metric itch? To which in my broken Urdu, I started replying, ke, nee, actually, I metric nahi ki, I did O-Levels, Senior Cambridge, as it was then called. And this guy turns to the guy next to him and says, ki chakkar hai, metric nahi ki ta. <laughs> So, you know, it was, quite a, it was quite far removed from their experience. But eventually it was all okay. And in fact, the guy that lived next to me is one of my best friends today. We went to medical college together. Even so till on. date? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Because most people from that hostel ended up in King Edward. And it was very merit-driven. Uh, so I'm still friends with all those guys. But, you know, that's how I... I didn't really like the hostel at all. So, yes, my mother did move till... दुनिया भर में टेक्नोलॉजी बहुत इवॉल्व कर चुकी है अब आप घर बैठे एक मोबाइल फोन से पूरी दुनिया में किसी किस्म की भी डिफरेंट एसेट्स स्टॉक्स या इवन क्रिप्टो करेंसीज खरीद सकते हैं जहां पर ये टेक्नोलॉजिकल एवोल्यूशन आया वहां पे भी अनफॉर्चुनेटली हालात ऐसे हैं कि इकॉनमी एक ऐसी जगह पर पहुंची हुई है कि बड़े आजकल बुरे हालात हैं इन्फ्लेशन बहुत ज़्यादा बढ़ रही है सेविंग्स हमारी डिप्लीट हो रही हैं ज़्यादातर लोग इन्वेस्टमेंट्स करते ही नहीं और जो करते भी हैं वो नाइन्टी परसेंट लॉसेज अनफॉर्चुनेटली बनाते हैं इसी प्रॉब्लम को सॉल्व कर रहा है सरमाया डॉट पी के जो कि अपने फाइनेंशियल ट्रेडिंग प्लेटफॉर्म्स पर ट्रेनिंग्स भी ऑफर करता है और डेटा भी ऑफर करता है जिससे आप पूरी दुनिया की मार्केट्स खासकर पाकिस्तानी मार्केट्स को बसानी देख सकते हैं अगर आप लोग अपने इन्वेस्टमेंट्स और ट्रेडिंग में स्ट्रगल कर रहे हैं तो आई वु डेफिनेटली अर्ज यू टू चेक आउट सरमाया फाइनेंशियल प्लेटफॉर्म इट्स अ रिमार्केबल प्लेस जहां पर आपको बहुत इंटरेस्टिंग यू नो रिपोर्ट्स के थ्रू डेटा भी मिलता है इन्वेस्टमेंट की एडवाइस भी मिलती है और खासकर उनकी ट्रेनिंग्स जहां पर उनके एक्सपर्ट्स जो हैं वो आपको क्रिप्टो uh, और स्टॉक मार्केट और कमोडिटीज और एसेट्स के अंदर ट्रेड करके पैसे कमाना सिखाते हैं सो चेक आउट द प्लेटफॉर्म एंड चेक आउट द ट्रेनिंग नाउ बैक टू द पॉडकास्ट बिफोर यू मूव फॉर आई लाइक टू अंडरस्टैंड वट वॉज इंग्लैंड लाइक ग्रोइंग अप Um, because the the years that you grew up there, बड़ा काम हमें पाकिस्तान में वो इन साइट मिलती है बड़े थोड़े पाकिस्तानी थे उस टाइम के ऊपर एंड आई रिमेंबर आई स्पीक टू सम वन रिसेंटली इन दुबई एंड दे स्पोक अबाउट द सिक्सटीज यू नो अगैन वन ऑफ दोज पीपल जो कि बहुत अर्ली डेज में इंग्लैंड में रहे हैं एंड ही स्पोक अबाउट एन इंग्लैंड दैट वॉज नॉट वेरी मल्टी कल्चरल मैसिव अमाउंट्स ऑफ रेसिजम बे ऑन लंडन एंड दैन ही स्पोक अबाउट दिस वन ईयर वैन वो उसको कहते थे स्किन हेड्स होते थे क्या होते थे वो बॉल्ड लोग होते थे आके वो कर करा करते होते थे एंड दैन टॉक्ट अबाउट दिस वन ईयर ब्रैडफर्ड में या कहाँ पर जब बहुत सारी पाकिस्तानी कम्यूनिटी ने एक राइड सी हुई थी एंड दैन डेट्स आउट ऑफ चेंज इट्स फैसिनेटिंग कि हम बड़ा डिफरेंटली देखते हैं वेस्ट को आज इन देंस लास्ट ट्वेंटी ईयर्स की वट वॉज द एक्सपीरियंस लाइफ फॉर यू So you're absolutely right. London, England was not at all multicultural, even London. I mean racism was rampant um and obviously as a child on uh, on one level that's all you know and so you don't really feel that it's anything unusual hmm. but at the same time when i think back and as i grew up a little bit one did realize that there was a lot of racism uh in school and elsewhere it was common to be called a packy and so on on the way home and things like that so on the one level it was fine as a child you grow up you have friends and within your circle you're okay but it's never far away and i i read somewhere i think mohsin hamid wrote that uh, ra- racial prejudice is like a hair that's fallen from your forehead and it's front of your eye and you keep flicking at it because it bothers you but you can't actually see it and i thought that was a wonderful description of exactly how and i just could relate to that completely that you know it wasn't something that was there all the time but it could happen at any time you know and right. to some extent that's true even today right. uh, you know few years ago I went to England I I go fairly regularly I was about to get on a train and these two kids on the train on the platform waited till the train was moving and then they shouted why don't you go back home now I don't know that it was me there were other colored people on the train too but you know one always thinks it's it's you right <laughs> so these things happen uh, but then all societies are racist I don't think we yeah, we're, that's we're true. not unracist ourselves so to some extent that's human nature yeah but it was certainly much more open in those days and it wasn't frowned upon the way it is at least in the public discourse in the west now so yes that that was an issue then certainly makes sense um it's better now but it's still there i think right what about uh, in terms of development um i think 
I was recently talking to my father. He's seventy-six years old, six days younger than Pakistan, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, I was talk- telling him about the economic crisis and so much, so, so many horrible things are happening. And yeah. uh, he was in the United States at the time. तो उन्होंने मुझे कहा उन्होंने कहा यार तुम लोगों का ना मैं भी बड़ा फैसिनेट होता हूँ कि तुम लोग कितने ना शुक्रे हो <laughs> क्योंकि हमारे वक्त में तो ही वॉज ही वॉज अ करियर बैंक वेरी सीनियर पोजीशन इन वन ऑफ द बैंक्स हेयर एंड ही वॉज लाइक इवन इन दैट पोजीशन मैं हफ्ते में दो दिन कारपूल करके के दो दिन मैं करता था दो दिन एक और अंकल होते थे उनके हाथ में जाया करता होता था हर घर में एक गाड़ी होती थी पूरा फैमिली उसी के राउंड घूमती थी आज हर घर में तीन गाड़ियाँ खड़ी हैं तुम्हारे दोस्त स्पोर्टेज और मतलब एस ले रहे हैं यू नो इस एज के ऊपर तो तो इन लॉट ऑफ वेज यू नो जो अगर मैसेज की बात भी करें तो जहाँ पर मैसेज जो है वो मट्टी घरों में रहनी थी आज उनके पास फ्रिज भी है आज उनके पास बेसिक्स भी हैं तो इन लॉट ऑफ वेज पाकिस्तान हैज डेवलप्ड यू जस्ट कॉन्ट सी इट और वो ही बस ऑफ टेलरिंग बैक टू हिज ओन एक्सपीरियंस ग्रोइंग अप इन ओल्ड लाहौर एंड एंड दैट मेड रियली मेड मी थिंक एज वेल और फिर मुझे होता है कि चलो पाकिस्तान का तो एक एवोल्यूशन चले आप यहाँ पर बहुत लोग हैं उनसे आप सीख सकते हैं बट रियली अगर आप किसी बाहर की कंट्री जिस डेवलप्ड वर्ल्ड को आज हम देखते हैं और कहते हैं कि वाह क्या डेवलप्ड वर्ल्ड है मुझे बड़ा होता है कि इफ आई वुड बीबल टू लुक बैक एट इट लेट से फिफ्टी ईयर्स गो एंड देन सी दी एवोल्यूशन देव हैड मे बी आई कैन बिगेन टू फील अ लिटल बेटर अबाउट पाकिस्तान एज वेल बिकॉज um you know evolution hoti hai sure. over time yeah. so what was england like in terms of development in terms of society mm-hmm. in terms of maybe some of the problems that we face in pakistan today so you know i always tell people that i think because people are always fascinated by how you know how did you adjust to come to back with life in pakistan and so on 50 years ago however long it was ago now 45 46 years ago the it was not that different you know i mean i think the the paths have diverged much more since then the technical technological advances and other things have really taken off there and we've really fallen further and further behind you're right on one level obviously we have also progressed we have not stood still but our trajectory at which we've uh, improved and developed i think uh, you know the scale the of angle has uh, widened without a doubt right um you know in england when when i was a child when i left there were four tv channels Uh, in fact there were three tv channels bbc1 bbc2 and itv and yahan pe we had ptv and you know ptv was, wasn't great but you know we used to show an english film once a week and this and that and you know wahan pe kojak aata tha to yahan pe bhi kojak dikha dete the you won't have heard of that i guess that was a, <laughs> a very no famous idea. program with telly savalas right and you know things like that so it wasn't completely out with the lived experience that i'd had there Um obviously overall England was dull and grey and in the 70s it was a bad time economically we we lived through the the coal miners strikes we had a three day week in England when I was really? in, in secondary school the coal miners went on strike to try and topple the Tory government and also to improve their own uh, wages and so on and we had power cuts we we had candles to light the house because there was no electricity because most electricity was coal fired at that time um and offices and schools had to close down and they would they would only have a three day working week which was great as 10 or 11 year old whatever i was at the time but it led to the downfall of the tory go- of Ed- edward heath's government and so on so it wasn't a wonderful play it wasn't you know nirvana by any sense right uh it was it was difficult times for them as well i think you know with margaret thatcher coming in in 1979 and the economic changes she produced i mean it it led to a greater divide between the haves and the have nots but materialism and prosperity and those things clearly burgeoned in the 80s and then on interesting and in terms of um pollution and um again mai hamesha circle back karta hu uh crown mein dekh raha tha aur uske andar jo hai wo ek episode hai smog wali um and i was just aur ye mai dekh raha tha jab jis time pe na us time pe lahore ki smog chal rahi thi नाम लगे तो अच्छा डेवलप्ड वर्ल्ड में भी ये मसला था एक जमाने में और आज हम देखते हैं और वो खूबसूरत है और वो बेहतरीन है और वो ग्रीन है um to jiska matlab hai ki hum bhi all hope is not lost <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think you know, well you know climate change is a, another matter of course, of it course. seems as though it may be lost there i don't know if these changes can be reversed right but yeah certainly in terms of pollution and the environment i mean they, these countries have shown that it is possible uh, to to improve those things but obviously there's a cost attached Mm-hmm. and part of that cost also involves you know making other countries continue to use those technologies while you move on to something else so you know this uh, selfishness 
involved there too, I think. But yes, it, it's certainly fixable. I don't remember the smogs as a child. I think that was mostly in the 50s. It, it, and it, it was fixed improved. by the time that you... The Clean Air Act and all had come in, I think, in the, in the mid-50s or something. But Bassey Power Station, for example, was a famous building. I'm sure you've seen it as well in London. Now it's a luxury apartments and shopping mall. But in the early 70s, I, I used to go home on the bus and I used to cross the Chelsea Bridge on the way home every day on the bus. And Batsy Power Station used to be pumping smoke into the air and the coal barges were still coming up the Thames to provide the coal. So into the 70s at least, there were still many coal-fired power stations, including in London. But obviously that's all history now. Right. Interesting. So uh, coming back to your, um, you're getting into the King Edward Medical College. First of all, the basic King Edward Medical College, when you went to the King Edward Medical College, is there a difference, do you think? Yes. Uh, the one standout difference that we all always talk about, uh, only half jokingly, is that when we joined, in the, I joined in 1980, there was a quota for girls hmm. in King Edward. There were 30 girls in our class and 240 boys. So you can imagine what that was like you know, in Pakistan. Yeah. The front two rows in the lecture theater were reserved for the girls. And every, all the, boy, the boys baying for blood were all at the back, you know. And it was a pandemonium every day until the teacher came in, you know, people throwing chalk and this and that, you know, anything to attract a girl's attention somehow. Uh, some years ago, I think they just opened it up and it was just based on however many marks you got for all the medical schools. So today, King Edward has a majority of female students. I don't know exactly what the proportion is, but it's virtually reversed. So much so that someone jokingly said, Ki ab ladki apni izzat bacha <laughs> Right. So that's one huge difference, obviously. Um, I think the other main difference is that, to some extent, King Edward has lost its preeminence. Aha Khan, other places, Shifa, CMH, the, the private medical schools, many of them are very good. Mm. And um, I don't know how they're ranked now, but you know they must be up there near the top somewhere. Uh, But Certainly has that affected the, the quality of King Edward itself or just the brand equity? Not necessarily the quality of the education they provide, but obviously the if the the cream of the cream, as it were, is not going there anymore because some of right. them are being diverted to other places, then that affects the final product, I suppose. But still, amongst the, medic, the government medical schools in the Punjab, King Edward, I think, is still the top place. And, you know, King Edward was founded in 1860. It's a great institution. Is just incredible. And, you know, yeah. it takes a while for these things to change and so on but there's also been a lot of development as well they've got a lot of new departments buildings i believe the curriculum has been updated we were studying the curriculum from probably the 1930s or 40s it hadn't we were still studying gray's anatomy possibly pakistan was the only country in the world that still used gray's anatomy a big thick textbook to study right. anatomy it's completely pointless no one needs that much anatomy knowledge but you know so those things have improved certainly They've moved to a multiple choice crew, exam format and so on. So, you know, they've dragged themselves into the 21st century. And how, so. and how was your experience? Five years, right? Yeah. Five. How, how well, were those five years? Five years officially. We were recovering from the delays throughout the 70s to the uh, academic year because of the various political troubles. I think well, early 70s, maybe there were various student strikes and stuff which resulted in closures, which delayed the academic year. Were student Here, unions and, and, and student politics a thing at King Edward's as well? When we joined, yes. Banned okay. shortly thereafter. Um, and then when was Mr. Bhutto was overthrown in 77, then when he was hung in 79, there were long, prolonged closures. So we were the session of 79 to 84, because right. we did FSE in... We should have done FSE in March of 79, we did it in September. So that was six months delayed. Then we waited nine months at home before medical school started, the best nine months of my life, because your parents couldn't tell you to study or anything. What are you It's supposed to study? It's basically guilty you know? freedom, right? Absolutely. <laughs> It was the best time. But anyway, so we started uh, medical school in June or July 1980, but we were the session of 79. Right. Should have finished in 84. Then further strikes and closures meant that we didn't qualify until the summer of 86. So passing everything at the right time, it took six years rather than five. Hmm. Um, The first two years in those days, we, we, they ran a preclinical curriculum and then three years of clinical. Well, what does that mean? 
So the preclinical subjects were the basic subjects like anatomy, physiology, pharmacology. You learn about drugs, about the structure of the body, about the way it functions and so on. But you don't see patients and you don't really discuss disease as such. You learn the normal. So that's very boring and lecture-based. And you, know, you, you uh, have cadavers that you dissect uh, to learn the anatomy and so on. So that was interesting. But the rest of it was pretty dull, biochemistry and so on. So it's a lot of facts and learning. So that was terrible. I hated it. And most people hated the first two years. Were you good at uh, facts and learning and sort of retta and... No, it was okay. It was all right. I mean, I passed. I, wasn't, I didn't get a distinction or anything, <laughs> but I passed. I was okay. Uh, I think I was Do you think right medicine is a lot of retta? Or do you think med- medicine is a lot of problem solving more than anything? Yeah. So I think the way we were taught, it involved a lot of rote learning. Right. Those things have improved, certainly the world over. And I think also here now. A lot of places now run a problem-based curriculum where from the first year, you start with a patient. And you say, okay, this is a patient with TB, for instance. Then you'll discuss the, the structure and the function of the lungs, the drugs that you would use to treat TB, how TB would present, what the pathology is, and so on. So you, know, you do it that way. Obviously, in first year, it's hard to do because you don't know anything about anything. But by third and fourth year onwards, that helps. So I think some medical schools run that here as well. But in King Edward, the great strength that they had was the clinical years, the third, fourth, and fifth year, when you start going to the hospital and you go to the wards and see patients. They had a breadth of experience and the teachers were outstanding. The clinical professors that we had were just fantastic, legendary people, you know. Um, So that was very enjoyable. I really, really enjoyed the clinical years and really found my... Uh, found myself in my element and thought, yes, I think this is what I'm going to really enjoy doing. And, I, and that really, uh, the clinical years were just an ordeal to get through, really, <laughs> to prepare you for the next three. And beyond the, the academics, what were those five years like for you? Again, you'd just come to Pakistan. Yeah. Um, probably either the only one or maybe one of the few uh, cultural shock to lag raha hoga na, <laughs> right? Uh, by King um, Edward, I'd been here a couple of years, so I was partly over that. But you know, but there, there was the a there was a Pakistan that was changing as well. It is Pakistan is was a yeah. was basically when the direction flipped as well. Sure. Um, and That's so, right. how did that sort of affect you personally? Yeah. So we, I think, most of us felt that the that period under General Zia was the worst time of our life. You know, it was just everything was so stifling, and you know, you couldn't do this, you couldn't do that. But was was it really like? Was our plonky level maybe impact how so stifling? Absolutely, like because you know, not that we were necessarily in contact with those people, but yeah. it permeated down through society. You know, so much so that people would get beaten up in King Edward or in college for talking to a girl. Really? Yeah. yeah. So you know, we you talked about elections. So we had student union elections in the winter of 1980. And they were the last elections we had. I think unions were finally banned in 82 or something. So there was, uh, I guess, a right-left divide. There was the Jamiat. And there was always a, an opposition to the Jamiat. It was called different things in different colleges. But they were basically the antithesis of what the Jamiat was. You know? mm. So we had the pioneers in King Edward, for instance. So you know, they won the election as well. But, and again, you know, some of this is just hearsay. We don't necessarily know who belonged to what party and you didn't necessarily need to belong to a party. But there was a lot of this sort of thinking, oh, why were you talking to her? You shouldn't be talking to girls. And, and, it, and some of the teachers would also do that, you know. So girls that talked to boys would get into trouble when they had an anatomy test, for instance, because they'd be noticed and they would fail them for that, you know, things like that. So it was a, it was a difficult time. Hmm. Um, but... The saving grace for me, at least in the first two years in King Edward, was that a number of other kids came from overseas right. to study medicine at King Edward. And these were people like me who were of Pakistani origin and parenthood. But they, unlike me, I had come a few years earlier, they came specifically to attend medical school. So about three or four from the US and three or four from the UK. So that was my immediate group there. You know, we immediately made friends and bonded. And again, I'm friends with those people till today. Right. So that was a little group within a group. But obviously, there were lots of other great people there too. And you make a lot of friends. So some of those are friendships that last a lifetime. And then medicine is, particularly when you go into the clinical years, it's very immersive. You know, you're with people 24 hours a day. You're on ward duties and so on. You spend the night with people. And, you know, you're, 
in the casualty department seeing patients all night. So there's a lot of bonding and camaraderie there too. So hmm. that was very nice. I, I really enjoyed that aspect of it. Right. And so then in the last two or three years, I also moved into the hostel. I was finally grown up enough <laughs> to do that. So the hostel is also, by that time, I really enjoyed the hostel. A lot of independence and, you know, we would always go to see the 9 to 12 show at the, in the cinema, which I could never do when I was at home because I had to be home by 9 o'clock, you know. <laughs> so it was a reaction to that. We never went except for the 9 to 12 show, you know, things like that. Right. It's good. So you, uh, so you graduated in 86. Yep. And what did you do after that? So you have to do a year's house job. And at that time, I think you needed to do that in order to get full registration. You were provisionally registered with the Pakistan Medical and Dental Council when you registered, uh, when you graduated. And then a further year to do um, the pre-registration house job, as it was known, which is a kind of apprenticeship, a practical training, uh, after which you got full registration and after which you could then decide what you wanted to do thereafter, go into general practice or whatever you wanted to do, or go into postgraduate training. The only kids that didn't do that were those who were off to the US, for example, because there that year didn't make any difference. You started from scratch anyway. If you wanted to go to England, as I did, to do postgraduate training, then uh, at that time, the GMC, the General Medical Council in the UK, they also required this house job. So I did a year's house job, and then I worked for another year in Mayo Hospital uh, as what they called a medical officer, hmm. which is a kind of junior doctor, essentially, on the wards. Right. In which time I gave the PLAB test to allow me to go and work in the UK, and then I went. And this was again late eighties, right? So yeah, so I went in eighty nine. When do you think the 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 private hosp like private university private medical school revolution happened? So around that time, but I mean Aha Khan opened while we were at King Edward. Okay. I think we were in third year or fourth year. That was the first private open. medical school in Pakistan? To the best of my knowledge, yes. I'm not entirely sure, but I think so. Right. Uh, and then thereafter, I, I'm, I'm not sure, so I don't want to misquote, but I don't think there were very many others into the 90s, but sort of late 90s and then 2000s is when every man and his uncle started opening a private medical school. And, you know, some of them were literally, some were very good, um, but some were literally sort of converted houses that were attached, you know, you, you may, you've got a private hospital, you buy the house next door and you sort of open a medical school there. So I think there was a lot of controversy about those kinds of places and how they were recognized and was it appropriate. I think over the time the PMDC has done a good job in pulling a lot of those up. Right. But I think the standard is still very variable. The, the regula regulatory framework as it has evolved over time, um, आज का मैं पाकिस्तान जब देखता हूँ और पाकिस्तान का हेल्थ केयर सेक्टर देखता हूँ तो मुझे एक बहुत डिस्ट्रीब्यूटेड वेरीड किस्म का हेल्थ केयर सेक्टर नज़र आता है कोई सेंस नहीं है कि क्या है क्या नहीं है कौन सा डॉक्टर है कौन सा डॉक्टर नहीं है अगेन कुछ फेंट मेमोरीज ऑफ द नाइन्टीज़ हेल्थ केयर वॉज वेरी स्टैंडर्डाइज एक्सपेक्टेशन होती थी आप डॉक्टर से भी मिलते थे ना दे ऑल लुक द सेम दे ऑल टॉक द सेम अब ये है कि अब अब फॉर लैक ऑफ बेटर वर्ड इट इट फील्स लाइक के देर लॉट मोर क्वैक्स इन द मार्केट जिसको आप क्वैक तो नहीं कहेंगे दे कैन डेफिनेटली शो यू द क्रेडेंशल्स बट यू डू समाइम्स रियली थिंक अबाउट के हाउ डिड यू एंड अप Do you think we we have a well-regulated healthcare industry today with the mushroom growth of everything from clinics to hospitals to what demand side जो है वो sustainably और structured तरीके से मुझे लगता है grow नहीं की वो demand demand side grow की तो उसमें supply ने बस जहाँ से उसको space मिली उसने कहीं ना कहीं से उसको fill करने की कोशिश की to the extent I remember this one day my uh, my uh, cleaning lady came to me and she was like my nephew needs a job. I was like, okay, what sort of a job does he need? And she said, anything, maybe a clerk in a in an office would be fine. And mm -hmm. I was like, okay, what sort of experience does he have? And she was like, oh, he's a doctor. I was like, what do you mean he's a doctor? <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, oh, you know, he um, he has his clinic down out in Ternal, and uh, um, but uh, you know, times are tough, and mm -hmm. clinics aren't doing that well. And um, I was like, how did he come about being a doctor? Yeah. She's like, oh, you know, he uh, at a very young age he worked with this doctor, and then he worked with him for okay. eight, ten years. 
ट्रेडिशनल अप्रेंटिसशिप एंड नाउ ही जस्ट यू नो बेसिक तो वो बेसिकली क्या कौन सा अगेन डिमांड सप्लाई थी आपने डिमांड को मद्देनजर रखते हुए आपने सप्लाई नहीं बढ़ाई तो उस सप्लाई को फेल किया विद क्वैक्स जो कि आके बुखार का टीका लगाते हैं और फिर साथ तो दस और चीज़ें करते हैं जिसकी वजह से चीज़ें खराब होती हैं सो वॉट वॉट यू थाट्स दैट सो we can talk about the regulation uh, and the regulator at length because i was involved peripherally with the reforms of the pmdc as well when uh, until beginning of last year but the medical profession jaisa bhi hai is still regulated yes it could be better i think the degree of regulation has improved it could certainly be better but the other issue is that these other people are really not regulated at all so you know there there are laws about how doctors should function and there are penalties associated with not functioning to those standards and so on and there are now provincial health care commissions which look at these things and so on and i believe it's part of their remit to look at these other traditional and um what we would call non qualified people but the degree of regulation there is much more lax i think mm-hmm. uh, you know i don't know what kind of license this person had for his clinic in Tarnal and whether he had any kind of licensing or I doubt it yeah, somehow the, yeah. you know do you think so, regulation maybe exist karti bhi hai lekin uski implementation itni strong nahi hai so why it's variable no the regulation right. exists it's much jaisi bhi hai it's much more forcibly enforced for physicians doctors right people with an mbbs degree as opposed to these other traditional and homeopaths and uh, just out and out quacks as you refer to them uh, who are not regulated at all really Uh, right, so i think that that's a major issue because again homeopathy is a recognized science i'm not denigrating it in any way but uh that also needs to be regulated and you know if i just suddenly start calling myself a homeopath that doesn't mean that i am one and then to call that person out is not to say that you're against homeopathy necessarily but the fact that you need to regulate these things makes sense so uh but you know the pmdc a lot of work was done in the last government to regulate it in fact a new act was uh brought through parliament and it was um essentially revamped completely uh the registration processes and so on were all converted to online people could apply from overseas you know a lot of facilitation in that way also a qualifying exam was um a post qualification exam was introduced only after you pass that could you practice medicine so you went to the uk in 88 89 89 and uh, you went there to work or mm-hmm. did you do a specialization there the, the two were synonymous in okay. the uk and, and in the us in fact uh, as a doctor specializing in medicine or a postgraduate discipline you work in a hospital and you study and do your exams and stuff at the same time so yes you work full time and you study as well and what did you decide uh, your specialization so i decided to do medicine first gen- general internal medicine so that's a 3 year training program initially after which you do the mrcp or the membership of the royal college of physicians and then you choose the sub specialty um so i chose to do gastroenterology which was a further 3 years of sub specialty training and uh i think that was partly because i was like procedures and you know pure general internal medicine is a cognitive specialty endocrinology and others this sort of thinking specialties which doesn't mean gastroenterologists don't think hopefully but you also get to do procedures you know we do endoscopic procedures put tubes inside the patient's body from various places and you can do diagnostic and therapeutic procedures so i liked the idea of doing a procedure as well hmm. so that was one of the reasons i went into gastroenterology also i thought there's a lot of hepatitis and gastroenterologic diseases in Pakistan I was wanted to come back to Pakistan that's right that was yeah. a given thing ha uh-huh, ha absolutely why this was from well because I'd lived in England already it didn't really hold any great attraction for me you know I wasn't my eyes were not a glow when I went to England I thought yeah fine you know <laughs> been there done that but also I think we were always brought up with this view as I mentioned I think that we were always going to go back to Pakistan and we don't belong here and I never really felt I belonged in England interesting i could assimilate okay you know i could um, i mean there's some obvious differences but other than that you know i could at work i had no problems i was accepted i did all the things i got all the jobs i needed and so on i could have stayed but i never felt at home there uh, do you have kids yes I have are two they boys. in pakistan or uh so they 
were in Pakistan till they were 18. They both went to school, did their O-levels, A-levels and stuff. Both went to university in England uh, and are still there. They're in, one is a physician, so he's also training and doing postgraduate training. The other is just uh, went to UCL, did a degree in economics and then went into chartered accountancy. I have 15 exams to do in chartered accountancy. <laughs> it's horrific. Um, and he's done 14 of them. His next, last exam is next month. So he finishes then. And I think he'll probably stay there a few years as well. But at the moment, they both frequently and repeatedly express the intention to come back to Pakistan. They do. Yes. Because and that's my, entirely without my Because my understanding would have been that I was thinking that the person who is the thing that बहुत इजीली मिली भी होती है उसको वो शायद नहीं अट्रैक्ट नहीं करती मे बी यू वर बोर्न एंड ब्रॉट अप इन इंग्लैंड सो पासपोर्ट भी था वॉट एवर बट मे बी आई वुड थॉट के फॉर दैम इट वुड बी दर वे अराउंड वेर वो होता ना दूर के ढोल सुहाने इंग्लैंड टाइम्सली अनफेमिलियर बट यार देव नेवर लिव दैर Right, and obviously, having gone to university now, they'll they'll also be a time soon. I think where they'll they'll have spent a significant portion of their life, maybe a third or a half of their life there. But Baral, well, that's that's what they say, and you know, I have not forced them either way. I didn't force them to go. I won't force them to come back. <coughs> but that's what they want to do. So you you as soon as you were done with your specialization, you decided to come back. Yes. Did you have an opportunity here already, or were you going to look for it once you were? So back? I was going to come back anyway. Right, and actually, that led to one of the major mistakes I made in my life. I um, sort of mid 1994, I was starting to think about coming back. I had basically done my training. I was working as a consultant, and um, I had applied to a couple of places, but never really got a reply. Even you know, which is the norm, I think. Uh, and I spoke, was talking to my mother on the phone one day, one of those hurried conversations that you'd had, everything okay, sab theek hai, sab, do, da, das minute isi mein guzar jate the. So with the phone cards, you know. Um, and she said, ke, well, this guy Imran Khan, he's opening a hospital somewhere, why don't you apply there? So I said, well, the cancer hospital nahi hai, well, oncologist, he must only want cancer specialists. I had no real idea of what it was going to be. And she said, well, send me a CV and I'll try and find out where it is and I'll go and, you know. So she, I posted her a CV, there was no email in those days. And she set off in her car to try and find this place in the middle of nowhere because the so hospital was... So she was not connected to anyone over there? No, it was just no, a not random at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. She literally <laughs> drove out into the sticks <laughs> and Puchte Pachte, she got somewhere, it was a building site. And there was a girl that I later worked with who was working in marketing or something. And, in, and there was a little hut to one side, Jampu wo bethte te sare. And she handed the CV over and you know, that was the end of it. And then a couple of months later, I got a letter from Dr. Noshir Van Berki, who is Imran's cousin and is a professor of medicine. He was at the University of Kentucky at that time. And he was the, what was called the chief medical advisor. And he was recruiting all the consultants. And he wrote to say that he'd like to talk to me, he called me. And he said, well, you know, we don't really need a gastroenterologist. But I saw your CV and I was intrigued by a couple of things which he told me later. But basically, we might have a part-time position for an endoscopist. Okay, what is which that? Which means a, someone who does endoscopy, the camera test where you look inside the body. So a, a part of what a gastroenterologist does. So he was, he was offering me a part-time job, essentially. And I made the mistake of saying, well, look, I'm going back to Pakistan anyway. So I'll take it, you know, if you can give me a part-time job, it's good, you know, puts bread on the table and then we'll see ke baki kya hota. I was very much in the traditional model, you know, you go back and you set up a private clinic somewhere and in those three hospitals, you do work, you do work, you do work, and you know, I started to practice, but that's what most people did, you know. Do you think you were very ambitious as a person? I think in retrospect, it was very foolish to be thinking about coming back to Pakistan in the way that I was. I'm not sure if I was over ambitious. I think I was quite foolhardy. Right. Because uh, I had a son at the time. I had a wife and a son. And, you know. But I, I never really thought too much about it. But you know, I just thought, okay, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, exactly. So hmm. he said, look, I'm going to be in London in July, July 1994. And why don't you come and meet me? I'll be uh, staying at Imran's. 
And I thought, oh, wow, Imran, you know, this is two years after the World Cup, Imran Khan, you know. So I was more excited about the prospect, Kishai Imran, be you know? <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, I drove up to London. It was a Saturday, South Kensington, very really nice place, Imran Ka flat. Go knock at the door, thinking Imran, I go, bat chat karenge, you know, <laughs> we'll bond. So it turns out, Imran to had tiny vampe, or he was only Dr. Badki there. And he interviewed me and he said, you know, he offered me a job, essentially. One thing he was intrigued by on my CV was, you know, England and then Pakistan. But what I think really struck him was that I'd spent a year at St. Mary's Academy, which is where he'd gone to school, too. So that was a right. kind of immediate talking point. And then he went to King Edward as well. Anyway, so at the end of it, he said, OK, we'll give you a part time job. And what do you want to get paid? Now, in England, in the NHS, even today, Salaries are fixed according to the scale that you work at. You're a, a registrar or a consultant or whatever you are, you know, a houseman, foundation year doctor, as they call them. So I was used to this. I didn't know that you were supposed to negotiate your salary, which is what everyone does in the US, apparently. So I said, well, whatever you pay and, you know, whatever everyone else gets paid is what I'll get. I'm happy to get paid. So he offered me what was in, even then, a ludicrously small sum of money, which is too embarrassing to mention now. And I said, fine, if that's what everyone else is getting, I'll, I'll take it. And so, you know, it wasn't that he was lying, but, you know, he was actually paying oncologists and other people much more. But they were full time and this was supposed to be part time and so on. So I turned up and I joined and, you know, that was pretty much it. So the, the mistake that you mentioned early on was, was not to negotiate. Was not to yeah. negotiate right? and, to, and to say, I'm coming back anyway. Right, right. You know, right. if you say to someone, well, I'm coming back to Pakistan anyway, that's half the battle done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm now in charge of recruitment. I have <laughs> been for many years. And one of the hardest things is to get people to, come, to agree to come back to Pakistan, even if they want to. You know, people play hard to get. Well, why should I come back to Pakistan? I could just stay in England and earn nine times what I'm earning in Pakistan and so on. Makes so, sense. two mistakes there. Makes <laughs> sense. How long did it take for you to move from part-time to full-time and... No, I, the job, by the time I actually came, the job had metamorphosed into a full-time position. So actually in October that year, he wrote again to say we want a full-time gastroenterologist. Right. So by the time I and joined, And he joined in 95? No, December 94. December 94. First December 94, the hospital opened on the 29th of December, so I joined mm. four weeks before. Right. Um, was the scale of the opera, uh, operation same as it is today? No, or was it a very small much, sort of... Much, much smaller. It was, a, it was an unbelievable experience, you know. As a physician, you never really go into a new hospital at the ground level and... Build it up. ...grow as, it, as the hospital grows, you know. Most hmm. places have been there forever. Uh, Mayo Hospital was... I've been there since 18, whatever, and all the hospitals I worked so in. So you're really been, focused you know, on being a cog in a machine, doing a job, going home. Exactly. Here, was it more startup be here? Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I, as an endoscopy, for instance, I was on my first day, the, that girl Fatma that I mentioned, mm -hmm. she was by then sort of working in HR, and she was the one who would greet all the new consultants. Well, Lamsky Padiviti, very personable, well spoken. I think it was kind of considered ke bilkuli, you know, inko sare bar se aare, to thoda, you know, soft landing on the <laughs> She's a lovely girl. And uh, she took me into the hospital, gave me the tour, and took me to two bare rooms. There were paint ni wava tha, bichli ke sockets ni lage wethe, false ceiling ni hoi bithi. And she said, this is the endoscopy unit. So it's yours, now you do what you want with it. So I actually decided ke bichli ke sockets ka lagenge or, you know, monitors can't log in and so on. So, you know, from that level onwards, rightly or wrongly, that's another matter. But, you know, we were the ones who decided this. Oncologists, they decided that chemotherapy is going to be you know, things like this. Otherwise, you go into a functioning machine and everything just, you just fit in. Here, we were designing the processes and the systems, so it was fantastic. Do you think... It's uh, an experience that is very rarely yeah. given to a physician. Do you, you think know? that uh, because of that direct connection, because normally people are doing all management and they are designing it, and they are saying, if you want to work, you will work. It's the same way we have said. So, so because the the one who has to use it was so directly involved, mm. do you think that played a major role in in the quality of service in years to come and the processes that were created? Undoubtedly, overall? I think so. It wasn't just managers deciding these things; it was driven by physicians very much so. And the physicians were given a preeminent space within the organization to help to grow it and direct it and so on. 
And it's not by chance that the CEO, Dr. Fessel, has been CEO since 2000, 23 years. I've been medical director and then chief medical officer for since 2004. So, you know, physicians have been given that, uh, the reign to be able to sort of do this. Uh, and that's why the system has developed the way it has. What's also happened as a result of being then at the ground level is that nothing seems insurmountable now. You know, the, mm. the challenges we faced then were just unbelievable. I mean, so for instance, Imran was not in politics, but I think was already perceived as a threat. And so the hospital opened on December the 29th, 1994, without electricity. And we did not have electricity for six months. Really? In a building designed for central air conditioning, so no windows that opened, stiflingly hot, no air conditioning, no, no light. So we had two enormous generators, which the Pakistan army lent the hospital because Dr. Berki had been classmates in St. Mary's with someone who was the army chief or the last army chief, I forget, something like that. So, you know, we had a little bit of goodwill from there. So they lent us two enormous generators and the hospital ran on generators. But that meant that the CT scanner and the radiation machines, which were the priority, they got electricity. We got electricity for lights and fans, but not for the air conditioning. Right. And but there were no fans either because it was centrally air conditioned. So from the very so we get had to buy go, pedestal fans. Very get go. You were working with your hands tied behind the back, in one way or the other. Yes, to start with, we had to go out and buy a new wardrobe, because. We all used to go to work in shirts and ties and stuff in England, even in America, I think. And as it got unbearably hot, you know, January, but March, April, me and this other guy that was a chess physician, Mansoor Javed, we both went to Amar Classics to buy T-shirts, you know, polo shirts, because we had to stop wearing shirts. It was so hot. And uh, I think some people even brought in their own fans, which were short desktop fans, or to, to, you know, just to work through the clinic. But anyway, you know, right. these things... You mentioned uh, Dr. Faisal Sultan since 2000, uh, yeah. the CEO, and you <coughs> being the medical chief medical officer since 2004, mm -hmm. almost 20 years next yeah. year. Mm -hmm. um, do you ever worry about succession? Um, but it's important that institutions yeah. develop more, but personalities not develop more. Very Obviously, I'm I'm not sure Dr. Faisal Sultan has joined here, but you guys both have a, have a certain legacy attached to the sure. institution. Yeah. Uh, the first movers um, generally wo tuk chal jate aur ye na main generally when i speak to uh, businessmen so i always ask this question particularly those from karachi because wahan par jo hai wo jo mehman seth ka jo style of succession hai na wo more often than not leads to uh, a, a major shake up of of, of the industry mm -hmm. but pakistan mein wo rivaj nahi hai institutions banane ka جس میں آپ کسی وہ انسٹیٹیوشن کی خوبصورتی یہ ہے کہ پروسیس اور انسٹیٹیوشن ہونا تو آپ پلگ کوئی بھی کر دیں سسٹم ویل جو جو میریٹوکریسی ہے وہ سسٹم ڈیفائن کرے گا سو اف دے ڈونٹ فال ان دا میرٹ دا سسٹم ویل ڈرائیو دم آؤٹ ون وے اور دی ادر کوئی یہ نہیں کر سکتا کہ ایک غلط بندہ آ کے پورا سسٹم تباہ کر دے سو سو پرابلی ایک کوشچن کے دو ایک پرسنل لیول کے اوپر ڈز دیٹ از دیٹ سم تھنگ دیٹ یو تھنک اباؤٹ کہ یار اوکے می بی آئی ایم آئی ایم سکسٹی ٹو Maybe I should retire. Mm. You know, bete se baat karo. Kare yar, yeah. baaji, relax <laughs> kare. But then the fear hai ke yar, you know what? Like this is my baby. I've mm. I've built it with so many other people. I can't leave it. Mm. And dusra, do you think there are enough structures in place? Ki jab ye do major personalities chhod ke jayenge, ek ek, ek major sure. shake up hoga us institution mm. ke liye, right? Ek legacy khatam ho rahi hai. Yeah. So I'll answer that second one first. Right. So we have actually. The board has, and we have, actively participated in that process. We've been developing the structures to try and ensure that this doesn't happen. Clearly, I think when someone's been around for 30 plus years, whenever they leave, there is going to be kind of a, a void suddenly. But a lot of effort has been put into making sure that that is not something that cannot be filled. So we've got, um, initially we only had the hospital in Lahore. And at that time we had a CEO and a medical director. The CEO was overall in charge. The medical director was responsible for the clinical side and overall for clinical quality. And one thing that the board did from very early on, I think from inception, was that the medical director reports administratively to the CEO, but also reports independently to the board. 
because the CEO is, is a physician, as it happens, but may not always be. And it was felt very important that the medical staff always have direct access reporting to the board so that if they have clinical concerns, highlight, they want to highlight issues, a CEO who comes in and says, let's just stop treating patients for free, for instance. You know, these things need to be able, we need to be able to, be able to report those independently. So that's the structure until 2015. When Peshawar opened, we realized that, you know, there's a whole new entity out there which cannot be run exclusively from Lahore. So then a, a new structure was developed where a CEO and a CMO are overall for the trust to oversee the administration, administrative side and the clinical side for, the entire for group. all the organizations. Right. And then each hospital has its own medical director as well as the chief operating officer. So we have created that second level now in both Peshawar and in so that, Lahore. So that can potentially elevate eventually too. Yes. So right. that's a succession plan. Also, we've got a number of associate medical directors who are from the consultant staff who have been um, department heads and other things who've sort of grown with us through the system. So there's also a third line for the medical side. And then on the administrative side, again, although we don't necessarily recruit from internally only, we always advertise all our positions because you want to get the best person you can. Some of these things are so niche that it's likely that they'll be from within the organization, but it's certainly not essential. So we have a number of other administrative and other directors who can all vie for the positions of COO and so on. So we have built those structures, yes. Um, have I thought about retiring? No, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, I think if a time came when I, when the institution wanted me to step down and appoint someone else, I'd be okay with that. And I, if they allowed me to continue to function as a physician, I'd be happy with that too, because certainly I don't see any reason to stop functioning as a physician. Are you still uh, working as a physician? Yeah, 50% of my time is clinical okay. and 50% is administrative. I used to joke that initially that that's because I don't know when they might fire me and they might not want me as medical director anymore. So, And endoscopy particularly is a very, it's an manual skill. You know, you need to keep doing it to maintain your dexterity. After 20 years, I don't know if they'll fire me or not. They might still, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that fear has receded a little. But, you know, I enjoy clinical work. Right, and I want to makes sense. How does, how's the, I mean, who sits on the board? How does the board structure work? So the board structure is that there, Imran is the chairman of the board. And there are five members from the family of Imran Khan or of Shokat Khanum, who was his mother. So from her family or their family nominees. Right. So at the current time, that is Imran, his two sisters, Alima Khanum and Usma Khanum, Dr. Noshirvan Barki, who's his cousin, but is officially classed as a nominee of the family, and Mr. Esan Mani, who was the chairman of the Pakistan Cricket Board and so right. on, famous chartered accountants and so on. So he's also a family nominee. Then we have uh, eight other members of the board from all across the country. Um, and these are retired judges, bankers, lawyers, some other medical people from the US and other places. So, so very diverse experience yeah, across all. Absolutely. Right. And the, the term is, for the non-family members, the term is five years, and you can have to serve a maximum of two terms. Right. And, and, and how- The board meets four times a year. So the board decides to offer, for example, if there is a <coughs> seat that is vacant, mm -hmm. the board uh, essentially sits down and decides who to bring on. Yeah, so the CEO and the CMO are board appointments. Okay. All the other directors, the medical director and so on, uh, have to have board approval but are appointed by the CEO and the CMO. Right. So they're makes, presented to the board. For make, make, makes sense. Yeah. You've been there since since the very start. Mm -hmm. If I were to ask you, uh, you know, like movies mein hota na, like, uh, building hoti hai, uska ek time lapse chal raha hota hai, building badi, badi hoti jati hai, mm -hmm. doctor's office uska time lapse chal raha hai, to purane vakt mein wo pads hai, phir yes. dabba computer aa raha hai, phir yeah. laptop aa raha hai. <laughs> Run me through the evolution uh, of Shaukat Khanam as you've seen it yeah. over the last 30 yeah, years. So it's, in a way, it's very much like that. I mean, if you talk about the dabba, the pad and so on, we transitioned from a completely paper record hmm to a completely electronic medical record almost 20 years ago. Uh, we have the hospital information system, it's homegrown. Uh, it operates across all our hospitals. Uh, we can access it remotely. It also works in our collection centers. Uh, we have everything on it, the patient's history, all their tests, 
uh, all their imaging. You know, we could access it from here, for instance. And Fessel and I once went to Brazil together, and we accessed it from there just to see. You know, obviously, it works everywhere. Um, it's also now on an app, so we have it on our phone as well. We can dictate into it. Um, and it also has, apart from the clinical modules, obviously, it also has non-clinical. So the human resources, finance, materials management, they all have their own modules. So it's a fantastic system. Mm. Um, and apart from things like consent forms, everything else is now online. We've given this away for free to government hospitals in the KPK. Uh, we've offered it for free to government hospitals in the Punjab in the past, but people didn't take it. Uh, we've also sold it commercially to people who can afford to pay for it, private hospitals and so on. So it runs, including in Islamabad, in a number of places. Um, but, you know, if you think about the, the overall hospital, when we opened, as I said, we were 10 consultants and 10 junior doctors. When we opened, there were no inpatient beds because the inpatient unit wasn't yet ready. And it was felt for about a day and a half, I think, <laughs> That cancer care is mostly outpatient and chemotherapy have outpatient basis per dengue or marise aenge, jaenge and you know. But of course, when you give someone chemotherapy, they get sick with it. And when they get sick with it, you need to admit them somewhere. And there was <laughs> no beds to admit them to. But there was a house on campus for the CEO, which was unoccupied. Dr. Budke was in Lahore at the time, but he wasn't living in it. It had, I think, three bedrooms. It was unfurnished. So within about six hours, I think on day three, we furnished that house as an inpatient unit, first of all. Because somebody basically required Someone needed admission. Yeah. There was nowhere to admit them. So we, and I think either the same day or the, the next day, one of those patients needed intensive care. And all the equipment had arrived, but there, there was a delay to the finishing of those rooms. So one of those rooms was then kitted out as an intensive care unit. And we ventilated some, we put someone on a ventilator and, you know, treated them there. So that was our first inpatient unit. And for about six weeks, I think, that ran as the inpatient unit come ICU until the, the beds opened in the main building. We had a lot of nurses in those days from the Philippines, some nurses from England, a nurse from South Africa. So it was a much more multi multinational kind of place at that time. Uh, and I think the Filipino nurses were the ones running the ICU at that time in, in that house. Um, similarly, the radiation machines had arrived, but were not, not yet operational. Hmm. It takes a couple of months to install and run and commission these machines. So uh, the radiation oncologists were also just seeing cancer patients and treating them with medicine and so on. Similarly, operating rooms were not yet open. So there's a lot of things that uh, our endoscopy unit was functional, but our scopes had not arrived. So I was in the curious position of having to refer someone with a mass in their large intestine, which we would normally biopsy from inside, for an ultrasound-guided biopsy, which I've never done before nor since, you know, Baharsi needle dal kiosmasi, tissue nikalna for biopsy, because that was the only way we could biopsy, and you can't give chemotherapy until you've established a, a tissue diagnosis. So, you know, it's really little, small acorns, said you'll get there, mighty oaks grow from, you know, little acorns. That's how it was. It was a very small place. The hospital was in the middle of nowhere, Johar town essentially did not exist other than on a map. The hospital was surrounded by wheat fields. And at five o'clock in winter, we would leave in convoy because people used to get robbed and mugged. And, you know, really? Kind of, yeah, yeah, absolutely. One of our engineers got shot by someone who was trying to rob him, I think in March or April time. So it was, you know, it was a deserted place. You didn't go there. When we were on call, if we had to go in to see patients, I remember driving in at sort of two in the morning and there were stories in those days that, that people would dress up as policemen and sort of put up a, a roadblock so they could rob you. So I remember going in and about two in the morning one, and there, were, there was a roadblock and there were two policemen there and they tried to stop me and I thought, I'm not stopping here. And I just accelerated and drove through and one of them picked up a gun and pointed it. And I kind of just slunk down in my seat. I don't know what use that would have been to me, quite honestly, but I thought at least, at least he won't get a headshot, you know? <laughs> and I just drove on, so I, I think he was just scaring me. Obviously, he wasn't really going to shoot. Right. So you know, it was a scary, weird kind of place at that time in that sense. Right. Now, you, you see ads on TV for housing societies and so on, which yeah. 
uh, sell themselves by saying only 17 kilometers past Chokotranam, and that's still considered Lahore, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, right. lots of changes. Um, and you've been like that has been your work. That place has been your workplace for 30 years. Yeah. In um, our life, really. I mean. Yeah. You know? Again, you told me early days. Come, I told you, two thousands. Uske baad, would you say then it was just mostly functional, or would is there so, any major so upgrades, yeah, when, changes? Huge changes, yes. I mean, when we opened, as I said, no beds. Then for the longest time, we had about thirty beds. Hmm. We've gradually grown to two hundred plus beds in Lahore. We've made a new, yes, we made a new building. We made a services building to move some of the offices and stuff out of the main building right so that we could create more room for inpatient facilities so the second floor of the hospital was entirely offices we moved all those into the services building and built a huge new 15 bed intensive care unit there uh, we had as i said no theaters initially we had then the plan was for four operating rooms we expanded that and made nine operating rooms in total Mm-hmm. Uh, we had three, uh, two radiation bunkers. We expanded because un- radiation bunkers are underground, so they're actually outside the main footprint of the main building now and underground. So we've got three more there. Uh, so all the clinical facilities have expanded hugely. We, in 2007, I think, or 2008, we were the first hospital in Pakistan to install a PET CT scanner, which is really revolutionary technology at the time, uh, but which you can't run cancer care without, quite honestly. So we were the first one to do that now we've got one in Peshawar two in Lahore now um, so all our facilities clinical facilities have doubled or trebled in size really in that time mm. um, the laboratory collection center network I think in 1997 or 98 we opened our first collection center opposite Jinnah hospital in Lahore uh, that was considered you know, a revolutionary thing at the time and now we've got close to 200 of them all across the country and we run a home sampling service now in major cities, Islamabad, Karachi, Lahore. So people can ring up and get their samples taken at home. And again, this just helps to generate revenue for the hospital so that we can treat more and more patients completely free. Makes sense. But throughout all this, we've stuck to that. We've always emphasized the importance of quality and equality in everything we do. So quality, obviously, we try and aim for the best possible quality in diagnostics and treatment. But, you know, the cornerstone of the hospital is that we provide the same treatment to all our patients. Doctors and nurses are blinded to the patient's financial status. We don't know who's paying and who isn't. So they get exactly the same tests, the same treatments, the same food, the same rooms to stay in. So, you know, there's no difference. Makes That's sense. what we pride ourselves on. Um, now, you're currently looking at both Lahore and Peshawar. Yeah. Um, <coughs> how would you say, in terms of quality of service, Lahore is a big city, the city is also talent availability is easier, the um, infrastructure is old. If you compare it to Peshawar, compare, to, were you able to maintain the same quality? Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, there is I mean, no shame in admitting that it's not 80% or 70%, but it's not going to happen. Right, right. No, so I think, as I said, quality is the be-all and end-all for us. If we can't do something to our level of our standards, we won't do it. So Peshawar, uh, we don't have all the services that we have in Lahor, but those that we do have operate to exactly the same standard. And, you know, I can say this and you can believe it or not, but there's an external indicator of that, which is the Joint Commission. So the Joint Commission is an organization which accredits all United States hospitals. It has a number of quality standards, 14 chapters, 285 standards, 12, nearly 1,200 measurable elements. It's a huge book of standards that they enforce on all hospitals in the U.S. And in the U.S., no hospital can function without that accreditation. So they have an international arm called the Joint Commission International, which accredits overseas hospitals to those same standards of quality. And they relate to everything you do, from the food you serve, to the way you prepare your drugs, to the care you provide, how you see patients, how you assess them, how you reassess them. If someone's got pain, are they seen within X minutes? Are they then reassessed within an hour to see if their pain's got better? If it hasn't, what have you done? You know, so that, that level of granularity. So in 2018, uh, our hospital in Lahore became the third hospital in Pakistan and the first uh, charitable hospital in Pakistan to receive Joint Commission accreditation. It's a five-day process where their US auditors come and evaluate all your systems and processes. So, you know, that's external validation. 
In 2019, our Peshawar hospital was also accredited, again through the same stringent process. And this is a three-yearly cycle. So in 2021, in the middle of the pandemic, Lahore was up for re-accreditation. And the world over, hospitals were refusing to be re-accredited during the pandemic because, you know, all kinds of corners were being cut and, you know, mm. all kinds of standards were being <laughs> relaxed and so on. But we decided that we would go ahead with this. And in fact, we did uh, obtain JCI re-accreditation for Lahore in 2021. And they commended us for the fact that, you know, we were one of only very few organizations which actually went ahead with the process. And the standards had changed as well. The standards had become more stringent at the end of 2020. So we did that. And then in 2022, it was time for Peshawar to be re-accredited because it was their three yearly cycle. But then uh, the JCI introduced a new set of standards called enterprise accreditation, okay. which was for specifically for organizations such as ours, which have multiple campuses across geographic locations or within the same city or wherever. So we decided to uh, um, submit both Lahore and Peshawar. Lahore didn't need to do it again. Lahore and Peshawar and our facility in Karachi and our centers in Lahore, in Liberty and on Jail Road, all of them together to JCI reaccreditation. So in August and September last year, all our facilities were surveyed individually by various sets of surveyors over, the, over about four weeks in total. And so we became the first organization in Pakistan and only the second in the world to achieve JCI enterprise accreditation. So, you know, whether, I mean, they're neutral, they have mm. no axe to grind. Right. So I think that's external validation of the quality. Generally, the regular JCI accreditation in Pakistan, mein, how many hospitals have that? Apart from us, there are two others. That's Ar it. Uh, Aha Khan and Shifa. That's it? That's it. Wow. <laughs> we, um, have, so we have two hospitals, Peshawar and Lahore. Right. And our centers, um, Karachi and so on. And there are two others. Makes sense. Um, okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to sort of, evolve the conversation mm -hmm. um, and I will do some small things first some things that generally the public says um, mm -hmm. I, want, I want your insight on that a lot of people have the, the critique that Shaukat Khanam uh, pick and choose their mm -hmm. uh, patients and they refuse a lot of people from treatment what would you say to that? Yes. So I would say that we need to step back and see how many cancer patients there are in Pakistan. Each year, there are over 180,000 new cancer patients diagnosed in Pakistan each year. Of those, nearly 45,000 come to our walk-in clinics. So we run walk-in clinics in Lahore and Peshawar and two in Karachi, one in our facility in DHA and one at our hospital site in Karachi where the new hospital is being built. So the walk-in clinics are where anyone can turn up hmm. with a diagnosis or a suspicion of cancer. Hmm. They'll be examined and they'll have their investigations and scans and reports, whatever they have, reviewed and assessed by our physicians to see if they fulfill our acceptance criteria. Hmm. If they fulfill our acceptance criteria, they're accepted for treatment into the system. Through this process, from 45,000 that come to us each year, we whittle that down to about 12,000 new cancer patients that we see, that we accept each year for treatment in either Lahore or Peshawar principally. We have a very small chemotherapy facility only in Karachi at the moment, so that's just 50 or 60 patients a year probably. You can either accept everyone, all 45,000, and give them all paracetamol, and you know, that's it, or you can treat them to a world-class standard of care, in which case you have to accept that there are limits to how many you can treat. So yes, we absolutely do not accept everyone we, that comes to us. We have acceptance criteria which are disease specific. So for a particular disease, it will be a certain age, a certain stage and so on. For another disease, it might be a different age and a different stage. And these are based on the likelihood of cure and the, our ability to treat them, which is multifaceted. Do we have the right physicians to treat it? Do we have the right drugs? There's no point in accepting the patient. Do we have the right surgeons, the equipment, and so on? Curability, because the bulk of treatment is provided for free, and it's provided by zakat. And people give us zakat, we feel, because they want us to use it in the best possible manner. And we feel the best possible manner to, treat, to use it is to treat someone who is likely to be cured, 
who can go back, contribute to society, look after their family, young mothers, you know, things like that. It's a hard choice. But at the end of the day, that's why we opened our second hospital in Peshawar, so we could effectively double or nearly double the number of patients we were seeing in Lahore. And that's why we're opening in Karachi now, because with Karachi, when it's fully functional, we'll be at, able to accept almost as many again as we're currently accepting in Lahore and Peshawar. So close to 12,000 new patients a year in Karachi also. But that will still only be 24,000 new patients a year. Mm -hmm. Our estimate is that there, are, there is a need for about 20 tertiary care hospitals the size of our hospital in Lahore to deal with all the cancer in Pakistan. Obviously, patients are getting treated elsewhere. There's a lot of good hospitals in Pakistan. And a lot of good hospitals provide very good cancer care. But there are very few tertiary care cancer hospitals. A tertiary care hospital is one where the specialized and more complex forms of diagnosis and treatment are provided and where all elements of cancer care are provided under one roof. So currently what happens is that, you know, there may be a good surgeon in one place, you'll go there, then you'll go somewhere else to have your chemotherapy, and then there'll be only one or two places where you can get radiation. And then the, the final stage of treatment, unfortunately, sometimes is palliative care. Hmm. Uh, palliative medicine is, which is the, the branch of medicine which looks after the symptoms of cancer and non-cancer diseases too, when a cure is no longer possible, when symptom palliation and alleviation of symptoms becomes the most important thing. So we run that too. And we are the only organization, in fact, in Pakistan, which has a training program in palliative medicine as well. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to turn people away, but we always tell them that, look, if we had the capacity, we would take you. And ref our refusal to take you does not mean that you cannot be cured or treated, just that we don't have the capacity to do it. And we'll also then advise them on where they can go instead. And we also have a system where all patients who were refused treatment at Chakathanam are offered counseling by a psychologist because it is very difficult and people come to us with a lot of hope. Mm. And this includes both the paying and non-paying customers? Yes, there are, there are disease-specific criteria for all patients. Uh, they may vary for private patients somewhat in that they may, they may be more lax because they're paying for their care and if they want to do it, they can. But again, there are finite numbers that will be accepted there too. It isn't an open door for patients yeah. who can pay. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, when is the Karachi uh, hospital opening up and uh, is it going to be opening up with the full scale or is it going to be slowly and gradually yeah. scaled up? Yeah. So the Karachi hospital was originally meant to open towards the end of this year. But mm. because of the issues we discussed earlier with the economy and inability to open letters of credit and imports and this and that, it's delayed. And at the current time, we think it will open sometime towards the end of 2024, inshallah. Right. So about a year from now. Right. Peshawar opened in phases. We opened, we, when we started, we were essentially treating cancer only with chemotherapy in Peshawar. For radiation and for surgery, those same patients would come to Lahore. Because, you know, that's a six-hour journey. It's still doable. Hmm. Clearly, Karachi can't open that way. So in Karachi, all services will start all at once. We'll have all the diagnostics, all the treatment facilities, chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, etc., all at the same time. But when I say 400 beds and 10 linear accelerators and 16 operating rooms and 30-something intensive care beds, we won't open all those all at once. So mm -hmm. we'll open in a scaled manner, two or three radiation machines to start with, four operating rooms, 50 inpatient beds, and then we'll build it up gradually as, we need, as the need And uh, what's grows. the location of that hospital? So the hospital is in a place called DHA City. Okay which is not DHA, it's DHA City, which is out on the highway. Okay. Uh, so as you leave Karachi, the first sort of major development that comes along is a place called Beria Town. Right. And this is a little bit further than that on the motorway heading into Sindh. But, you know, the hospital is meant to serve not only all of Karachi, but also all of Sindh. Right. And so from, for patients coming from Sindh, it's ideal because it's well before you reach the city. You don't get lost in the, the maelstrom of activity in Karachi. Also, we're on a kind of promontory on, the, on a hill, and we're visible from miles from the motorway. So people will hopefully be able to get off the bus or wherever they, however they're coming and come straight into the hospital right. from there. And what's the, what's the land size of all of these three different hospitals? So we have 20 acres in Lahore, mm -hmm. uh, 20 acres in Karachi, only six acres in uh, Peshawar. Possibility to expand in Peshawar or so, no? So, yeah, Peshawar, we made a vertical building. There was no limit on, well, within reason, there was no limit on height. In Lahore, there was a limit on height in Johar town when this hospital was built. And so the current count, the buildings are only four stories. 
But now uh, it's been commercialized or something. So now we can build uh, higher buildings. And so after Karachi opens, inshallah, we have a plan and it's all sort of LDA approval and so on has been obtained to make what we call a clinical tower, a new nine-story building in the Lahore campus, which will effectively double our clinical capacity in Lahore. So uh, that will probably start construction somewhere in 2026. Right. And then we'll take it from there. Um, in terms of... Okay, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff there, but let's start with the uh, with a very basic one. And you mentioned you you had nursing staff from all over the world, including mm-hmm. Philippines. And mm-hmm. what does the nursing staff look like today? Is it from Pakistan mostly, by yeah, and large? It's almost exclusively Pakistan now. Okay, how's the talent uh, in terms of nursing and te- technicians? Um, and again, context being, I recently spoke to uh, the chief operating officer of Kulsum Hospital, and uh-huh. you know, he mentioned. Uh, he was very troubled with the nursing talents that was yeah. coming in. He was like, doctors, you can definitely find good talent. Right. Um, but in terms of nursing, you know, it's just lots of random schools. They're just building people mm-hmm. up. Um, obviously, a medical knowledge is there. There is a side pe, jo soft a- aspect, the training of a person. How do you talk about it? How do you empathy? How do you have to do it? How do you have protocols kis tarah follow karne wo unfortunately bilkul bhi nahi aata and he was just like you know ye mostly it's just do char quality ke hospitals hain wahan par wo staff basically enter karta hai fir wo apna time lagate hain unko train karte hain jaise wo train ho jate hain to puri market no khinch ke le jati hai and consistent rotation hoti rehti hai that's right so i think there's no dearth of good nurses in pakistan we have very good nurses but the issues are as you say that it, there is a lot of variability obviously and there's a constant hemorrhage of nursing to other hospitals and overseas, which I think is bordering on criminal. I mean, Pakistan has a shortage of over two million nurses and most Western... Two million? Two million, yes. Two million, yes. I don't... Uh, it's not 200,000. It is two million. I know how many zeros there are in two million. Okay. That is the estimate of how many more nurses we actually need for Pakistan, for right. our population. So um, there are more and more nursing schools, obviously. At Chakrat Khanum, what we do is that we hire qualified nurses and uh, designate them as trainee nurses for one year. So they're not considered uh, staff nurses until they've undergone that one year of in-house training. Um, we then have a number of educational and training programs in service training and so on. And we also encourage them to do postgraduate degrees, which we will support financially as well in exchange for them agreeing to work for us afterwards. So we have a number of programs to try and develop nursing uh, skills and nursing leadership. But we're also then a prime target for recruiters for other organizations uh, within Pakistan. And unfortunately, well, fortunately, I suppose, but unfortunately for us, in the Punjab and the KPK, there's been a huge growth in the number of nursing positions becoming available in government hospitals over the last five to ten years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so a lot of nurses will leave, not necessarily because the working conditions are better, but because the work Career. is easier. I work is and easier. they're kind of full-time regular jobs with a pension and so on. Ours are all contractual jobs. We're all on three-year contracts. So, you know, which keeps everyone on their toes a little, I think. Um, but, you know, we look on this philosophically as, you know, this is also part of our mission statement to educate and to train and to contribute to healthcare in Pakistan. It's okay if a nurse leaves us. As long as she's going elsewhere in Pakistan, you know, we might feel the pain, but we're also happy on one level. Okay? They'll help to improve the standard of nursing care elsewhere in Pakistan. Right. What really hurts is the nurses that leave to go overseas. Right. Because they're irreplaceable. Mm. We have a, currently, we have about a 20% attrition rate for nursing. Across local and international or just international? That's all comers. The bulk of them are probably local. Right. Um, because you've been able to build a center of excellence, both in terms of oncology and then um, technicians, nurses, a lot of this, mm-hmm. um, other areas. Why did you never venture out into uh, schools or I mean, university, right? So a medical university, medical college, medical city, if you must call it, a nursing school. I mean, there's a cost overrun to sort of get the nurses in, pay them and train them for a year. Yes. You could flip the model (laughs) and you can take that money, put that into uh, care for patients and then also train them in the process. 
एंड so we... जो सॉरी मैं सो कंप्लीट कर लूँ कि डिमांड एंड सप्लाई का प्रॉब्लम है ना सो सो जहाँ पर आपको लेट से पचास नर्सेज चाहिए वहाँ पर आप 500 सौ ट्रेन करें साढ़े चार सौ आप मार्केट को देंगे भाई ये लोग खुश रहो और मेरी पचास या आई एम नॉट यू कीप द फिफ्टी इज वेल बिकॉज देर ऑल्सो अ प्रीमियम फॉर पीपल हुव वर्क एट प्लेस लाइक चौकाम सो यू प्रॉब्लम स्टिल लूज Um so we do have nursing education. We uh I said we talked about the trainee staff nurse program obviously but then we also have we've been running diplomas for a long time diploma in oncology nursing diploma in perioperative and critical care nursing and so on. But for the last 3 or 4 years we actually also now run a bachelor's degree program in conjunction with one of the local universities uh for nursing. So we um are doing conversion courses for nurses the traditional nurses who are not Uh, graduates hmm. but we're also running bachelor's programs for nursing now so we do have that but we haven't got our own university it's a school of nursing affiliated with a why didn't uh, you go for your own university um for the same reason that we haven't opened a medical school i mean you know we are a cancer hospital we want to stay wanna... focused on what we do we don't want to be distracted by uh starting something which will then become a bigger part bigger than the whole you know so we don't want cancer care and the cancer hospital to become a little appendage of something much bigger. Mm-hmm. Uh we've also discussed a medical school many times at the board level and within the institution as well. We've also for the same reason we've not done it because a as a cancer hospital we don't have all the uh various departments and specialties that you need to run a medical to open a medical school things like obstetrics, trauma, other simple things that come to mind but a number of others as well. uh and then also the um there are some regulatory requirements that we can't cannot fulfill so i said we have 200 inpatient beds because the bulk of our care is given on an outpatient basis we give over 120 patients chemo on an outpatient basis we treat radiation give radiation to the same number daily on an outpatient basis in the traditional hospital model all these patients would be admitted hmm. all patients under investigation are typically admitted while they're being investigated we do all this on a day day pay, day case basis so we only have 200 beds today after 30 years the pmdc requires 500 beds and a general hospital to open a medical school so you know it's an enormous sort of shift in focus for us right but part, but, but you are partnering with people so you that expertise inherently can oh, yeah. then be transferred to absolutely uh, yes. downstream yeah. yeah um you mentioned the 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 sort of um churn in terms of nursing staff mm-hmm. there's been a very um active conversation about brain drain in pakistan mm-hmm. of people mm-hmm. leaving uh because of the economic crisis yes. um has that impacted your more specialized staff in the last couple of years yes um what has that looked like and how are you dealing with that because yeah. your specialized staff is literally one in a million sort yeah. of a situation right it's not that Absolutely. easily replaceable yep. it has to be years of training yes um and so oh, expand on that yeah so i said we started with 10 consultants we're up to 130 odd now this uh, since january the 1st 2023 we have lost 12 and 1/2% of our consultant staff 17 people have left so far all gone abroad each of the 16 have gone abroad yes um each of these is virtually irreplaceable as you say it takes so many years to train these people uh the num we have tended to recruit from overseas from the US and the UK the number of people that go overseas it's it's a pyramid you know it's a, it's a funnel effect there's a only a small number of people that go overseas only a small number of them will then necessarily train in the the oncologic specialties that we need particularly and only a very small proportion of them then want to come back mm-hmm. when the situation is difficult here politically economically security wise whatever the reason then that number drops even further we always say thank god for parents parents are what brings people back to pakistan by and large uh and so that's traditionally been why people have joined but you know in in times like these where the the economy is you know tanking and there are various issues as to what's going to happen in the future young consultants i can't blame them you know i mean they look at the they look ahead and think well you know okay you've put your kids through university how am i going to put my kids through school and university sitting here and making this kind of money and often people will come to me and say look we understand and we cannot even ask you to increase our salary proportionate to what we've lost over the past year or two 
and, you know, these are people often who've, well, who've had experience overseas, who have contacts, who may have a foreign passport. They really have given up a lot to come back to Pakistan. Mm. And, you know, it's not just that the grass is greener on the other side. At this time, it probably is, unfortunately. So it's very difficult. One thing that we've done is, uh, apart from continuing to recruit and running overseas recruitment fairs and so on, is that over the past 20 years or so, we've had our own postgraduate training programs. So we have a number of people now coming through the training program. The best of the best of those, we then hire uh, to train them a little bit further, kind of finishing school, then we send them overseas for two years with the understanding that they'll then come back and work for us for five years as consultants. So, you know, that is some light at the end of the tunnel there, then there are hope now. But we continue to struggle with this. And the uh, mm. 17 people that I say we've lost, we've not managed to re um, replace any of them so far. And in terms of before this economic crisis, um, what was the churn rate for your specialized staff? And were there, I mean, for those who were going abroad, they would go abroad, yeah. right? But uh, were there people who were switching from Shogat Khanum to other um, areas within Pakistan? Mm. And follow up to that question, mm -hmm. how is your remuneration uh, compared to the local industry mm -hmm. for, these, for this talent? Okay. So before the sort of recent events, um, there was always an attrition rate. I mean, you know, some people, because we were recruiting from overseas, some people found it difficult to settle. Uh, more often than not, it was people's families that found it difficult to settle. You know, if they came back when their kids were slightly older, that was harder for them to settle down. I always, when I'm recruiting, I always say, well, fine, you want to, if it's a man, I would say, fine, you want to come back, but what does your wife want to do? And it's to the point now where if they say, well, she's not really keen, but I'll, I'll get her around to it. I always say, no, 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 don't do that. Come back when she's ready to come back. I'm not interested otherwise. Because, you know, if people are not happy and one half of the family is not happy, you're not going to settle. So uh, there was always that attrition rate was much lower than it is now. And that's why we grew from 10 to 130. Okay, it's 30 years, but it's been a steady increase. Um, in terms of salary, uh, oh, uh, sorry, you asked if people left for domestic opportunities. For the longest time, the only people that left were those that were going overseas. Over the last 10 or 15 years, a number of new private hospitals have opened in Lahore and elsewhere in Pakistan. I, earlier, I mentioned someone who had left us to come to Karachi for family reasons. So, you know, there, mm. there, there were a couple of people like that. Um, but a few people have left over the years to join other institutions in Lahore. But the majority have been and, and remain those that are, are going back overseas. In terms of salaries, we offer by far the highest salaries in Pakistan. Uh, one of our colleagues who left to join a famous hospital in Karachi uh, went for exactly half the salary that we were paying. So we pay very well. But again, you know, we pay in rupees and whatever we paid a year ago is today, unfortunately, in, mm. in dollar terms, is worth about, I don't know, 60% or something of mm. what it was worth then. In terms of, um, again, tailoring back to the conversation, you guys can check it out uh, with, the, uh, with the other gentleman. Um, he mentioned, you know, there's a lot of people who come back to Pakistan and we uh, you know we absorb a lot of them and uh, I asked him why these people were coming back what was the incentivization and one of the things that he mentioned was you know a lot of these people come back because they find it easier to work here you know there's the policies are a lot more relaxed um, and so my question to him was you know maybe then if I really look at it from the outside it seems like you're attracting the worst talent <laughs> um, that may just be on the verge of getting sued um, but you're still attracting them um, and you're providing them a safe haven and that really led me to a, a wider question um, I, I'm not trying to pinpoint sure. to, to, to the talent that anyone recruits but to a wider question in Pakistan do you think there are enough regulatory and then implementation wise enough fail safe for medical malpractice um, has there been occasions or, or, or precedents where a doctor or a hospital was sued for, um, you know, gross negligence or whatever you'd call it? Um, and in terms of the whole licensing regime, is it very actively practiced in Pakistan where the, if the license is not there, the license is not there? Yeah. 
um, and I want you to really answer this, not just exclusive to Shaukat Khanum, but you really mm. looking at the industry at large. Yeah. So I, I will just start with Shaukat Khanum, if that's okay. Um, Shaukat Khanum is not an easy place to work by any means. Most people will come and say, you've got a lot more rules than anywhere I've ever worked before. As partly driven by JCI, because we have to maintain those standards, and, and, and that's an ongoing thing. Once you're, you're accredited, they can come back and check you anytime. So it isn't just that you prepare for the exam every three years, uh, but it's also because of our culture, our institutional culture and ethos. And you know, we feel that those things are very important. It's not just to obtain an accreditation, it's that you've got to live it and breathe it every day. So we certainly don't ascribe to that view that you know, people find it easier to work here by any means. Um, I think there is a lot of regulation of the medical profession in Pakistan. The, 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 the regulator is the Pakistan Medical and Dental Council. They are quite active. Uh, we also have provincial healthcare commissions, which over the which are relatively new, last 10 to 15 years, but they've enforced at least in Punjab and KPK I know about uh, a set of minimum delivery standards, service delivery standards, which they enforce. Uh, those of us in the private sector, Shaukatanam is a privately run hospital, not a government hospital, feel that the standards are much more stringently applied to us than they are to government hospitals. And to some extent, that's understandable. I mean, the government hospitals, unfortunately, are not able to enforce many of the standards that we are. Um, but nevertheless, we do feel sometimes uh, that it's unfair that we are <laughs> judged by all the laws and regulations all apply to us and not to others. But that's okay, too. I think it's important that we um, hold ourselves to that higher standard. Um, I don't think that, uh, I wouldn't say that, uh, I'm not sure about malpractice the, the, um, you know, across the country, but there is increasingly, we are a litigious society anyway, about property and other things. And there is an increasing trend to uh, complain to the healthcare commission or to the PMDC. And of course, today, people don't need to complain to anyone. They just stick it up on Twitter and Facebook and so on. And, you know, for organizations like ours, which are heavily dependent on public goodwill, that is very serious. And we take all this very seriously. We have a very um, effective complaints process within the organization. We encourage people to complain, but to, to tell us if they've had a problem, because we look on these as quality improvement opportunities and we try and, you know, learn from them. Uh, we've been sued on a couple of occasions for things that have gone wrong, but you know, to err is human. And we try and distinguish between what, uh, what is a mistake and what is recklessness. Recklessness we do not forgive, but we understand that mistakes will happen and that the, the practice of medicine is not an absolute science. And, you know, you cannot predict in all cases how the human body will react to something. It won't always do what you think it's going to do. Right. Um, following the, I mean, carrying forward the conversation on regulation, you, you mentioned earlier that you worked very extensively on the new regulation that came out mm -hmm. uh, in in lieu of the Pakistan Medical Council. Yeah. I think PMDC se wo PMC, PMC. Ho tha. Yeah. And there was a there was a lot of confusion back at, at the time. Unfortunately, obviously, policy ki baat hoti hai, politics bahut zada automatically aati hai. The politics notwithstanding, mm -hmm. uh, exclusively focusing on the policy. What was the thought process, and really, what were the differences that were made at the time? Um, and 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 what did you hope to achieve from those differences? Yeah. So I was fortunate to be one of two or three people who helped to design, write the first draft of that, what became that act. Um, and the idea basically was to try and improve the system of regulation, to modernize it, uh, to improve it, and to make it more effective and to make it more accountable. Um, there were various issues. I mean, the, the system was quite old fashioned and bureaucratic. It involved filling in paper forms. If you look at the simplest sort of level, filling in paper forms, going to the PMDC offices with your applications and then waiting weeks and weeks for things to happen. So one of the things that was done was that a lot of this was moved online so people could apply from you know, their mobile phone or whatever for their PMDC registration and pay through a banking app and get your certificate electronically. Uh, one of the big things in Pakistan is the variable standard of medical education and how medical schools are recognized, regulated, assessed and so on. So there were a lot of changes in that process that were enacted. And then 
how do you ensure at the end of the day that the citizens of Pakistan get a certain minimum standard of care when they go to see a doctor? Okay, if the if the person graduated from King Edward or from Maha Khan or I don't want to mention one or two, Shafa or, you know, numerous other good places, then that's fine. But if they graduated elsewhere or particularly if they graduated in some overseas medical school, which we really don't know much about, how much can the PMDC go and do? I mean, can they go and assess a medical school in China, for instance? So we decided to institute a qualifying exam, a licensing exam, the NLE. Uh, which a lot of countries have, and a lot of countries which don't currently have it are also thinking of introducing it, like the UK, for instance. And that was meant to be a great equalizer that you could graduate from anywhere. As long as you can pass this exam, then the PMDC will be able to guarantee to the citizens of this country that this doctor has achieved a certain minimum standard and is safe to practice. So this was also included. Then the medical college admission test and the various, all the aspects of medical education, medical and dental education were included in this. And really, I think it was, a, it was a good act, and it wasn't just that because I was involved in it. I think most people felt that it was good. Unfortunately, as you say, there was a lot of politics involved and a lot of political players who have a vested interest because they have private medical schools of their own and so on. So there were a lot of other issues that came up, and I think that's one of the reasons that once the government fell, Imran's government fell, this was one of the first things that was rescinded unfortunately, which I think is very unfortunate. Do you think that this is the law that exists at the time? One thing is that one thing was right, we have optimized it. And one thing is that the thing is that it is primitive, it is potentially destructive, and uh, it is creating more problems than solutions. How would you categorize the current regulatory environment uh, in terms of how the PMDC functions? Well, you know, I mean, the PMDC is still functioning, obviously. It's still doing a lot of very good things, naturally, because that's what it's meant to do. Mm. But we, opti- well, we we would like to think that we optimized it and improved it. And uh, change, I think, is often a good thing. And we shouldn't shy away from change and we shouldn't oppose change just because it's change. So I think it was a retrogressive step. Uh, but that's not to say that nothing good is being done. Of course, the, the system existed. And we are still functioning along that system, but we've missed an opportunity to try and improve it, I think. Do you think maybe it came on too strong? Um, maybe the maybe it would have been better to phase it out? Uh, or do you think the, the opposition that came in was largely because of certain interests that would never have accepted yeah, it, irrespective I, I, of whenever? I think it was vested interests largely that right. drove the opposition to it. There was a very strong movement by the owners of private medical schools and so on, which opposed it. Uh, and I don't think those, the interests of the public were best served by that. Makes sense. If I were to ask you, there's a lot of conversation on the demand and supply of doctors in Pakistan. Sometimes I hear from doctors that there are no jobs. Mm. You, you hear young doctors graduating and saying, listen, like, I mean, it's one thing to say the pays aren't enough. And we'll talk about that as well. But mm-hmm. it's another thing altogether <coughs> to say there are no jobs. That makes no sense, sense to me for a country of 250 million people. Yeah. Um, with like diabetes, number one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you start naming it and it's just uh, the, the, the healthcare space is just extremely fragmented and, yes. and, and huge demand. Like you mentioned, you know, yeah. two million nurses. Mm. But then it makes me feel like, you know, even if you open like institutions that would f- create, let's say, two million nurses over mm. the next five years, they'll largely be jobless. Um, why do you think this problem keeps coming up more often than not with young doctors, once they have spent five, seven, ten years, you find them to be to be able to plug themselves one way or the other mm. at one place or the other. So I think there's two aspects to this. I mean, clearly there aren't enough healthcare facilities in this country proportionate to the number of people we have and the number of sick people that as a proportion of that we would have. So there is a dearth of healthcare facilities, certainly. Um, but the other problem is that doctors often don't necessarily want to go where the patients are. Mm. So there's an overwhelming desire, and this is a generalization, obviously. There are people, I'm sure, that go and work in rural areas very happily. But the bulk or a significant proportion of our population lives in rural areas. The majority of doctors do not want to go and work in rural areas, partly because 
it's nicer to live in a city or they think that opportunities are greater and you know they've got kids they want to put them through school and then put them through medical school and so on so there's that aspect to it as well that hmm. if doctors were willing to go where the patients are then there would you know there'd be more jobs available for them but of course the other aspect to this is that there are no healthcare facilities for them to work in in the rural areas often so it's a kind of catch-22 that the patients are where there are no facilities and the doctors don't want to go there, A, because it's rural, and B, because there aren't facilities there. The bulk of facilities tend to be concentrated in the cities. When did you last hear about the whole government, any government, opening a big hospital out in the sticks somewhere? It's always in the cities because that's where the vote bank is. And hmm. you know. But, I mean, obviously, government hospitals are government hospitals. and The government system mm. already but it's overrun mm. with mm. inefficiencies and mm. so on and so forth. I have a lot of interest in this podcast because I try to identify that okay, um, the thing that is not in control, it's not in control, it's not And so, over the last two decades, Pakistan has been able to get their money when they were getting their money. First of all, they were getting their money in the sandwich. Then they realized that at least a certain segment of the sandwich that the money in the sandwich is being burned every year yeah. with a high inflation sure. country like Pakistan. Yeah. تو اس نے کیا کرنا شروع کیا کہ اس نے زمینوں میں دبانا شروع کر دیا رائٹ اور زمینیں پمپ 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 ہونی تھیں اور اٹ واز دی موسٹ ان پروڈکٹیو مینس آف انویسٹمنٹ اینڈ سو ناؤ اٹس مائی اٹس این ایریا آف انٹرسٹ فار می ٹو آئیڈینٹیفائی ویلیو کیونکہ پیسہ لوگ پیسے کے پیچھے جاتے ہیں آپ ویلیو چینج سمجھ لیں تو پیسہ کمانا لارجلی آسان ہو جاتا ہے And so in that, when you see the problem statement, there is a difference between the demand and supply, the problem statement is the infrastructure problem, so then the logical conclusion is that then there is a requirement for investment in, in infrastructure. Okay, there will be 10 questions that there is management talent available or not, but that's a secondary step. Do you think in today's day and age, investment in healthcare infrastructure has a good um, profitability um, and a comparatively less riskier profitability? Yeah, is it more of a restaurant business where 97% will end up closing yeah. down? So, first of all, I'm not a health economist and I'm mm. certainly not an expert on this aspect of you know, this particular question that you're asking. But two or three things I w- would like to say about this. Um, I don't think that healthcare provided to an appropriate standard is easy or cheap to do. It's an expensive business. And I think that, I've got to be careful how I say this, I think that a number of private hospitals may face the temptation to cut corners in terms of quality in order to make a profit. So that's the reality. If they if they try and provide the kind of quality standards that more well-established places do, then it, it cannot be profitable. Um, I think, and I'm not here at all as an apologist or a spokesman for the previous government, but I think one thing that would have really changed the whole paradigm if it had been allowed to continue was the Sihat Suhulat card. That was a fantastic program which, uh, apart from the obvious benefits of allowing people who had no health care and giving them 10 lakh rupees a year per family of five and so on, it was going, it had started to, and it would really have led to a further burgeoning of growth in the health of the health industry, particularly in the private sector, because a lot of new hospitals were opening or people were planning on opening them, including in rural areas, because suddenly patients had the money to be able to pay for their care. So if that had been allowed to continue, that would have really changed a lot of the thing and would have uh, created more jobs for doctors, opportunities for nursing. And then when jobs and uh, start, then you know training also starts with that. So that's another thing which unfortunately is in abeyance at the moment is on ice, I think at least, if not being formally scrapped, I'm not sure what the latest status is. That would certainly have helped with this. Um, but in terms of just pure profitability, I don't know. I don't know. I, mean, I, I think I'm qualified I to answer so, that. So I'm going to I'm going to bring the conversation back, and we are going to wrap this up. It's one of the longest that we've done recently. But I'm going to bring it back to your areas of expertise, mm-hmm. on some level at least. Um, in terms of cancer, you've been in 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 Pakistan's 
only specialized cancer hospital yeah. um and yeah. the largest and one of the best in the world mm-hmm. when you look at the numbers do you see a change in terms of cancer i mean there is a there's a urban legend that we're hearing now mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. it says oh you know more and more people yeah. particularly more and more young people are getting cancer yeah. um <coughs> for me it could very well be i mean correlation is not causation wali baat hai ki i'm not sure if that data is is identifying whether cancer has increased or whether diagnosis has increased where previously you'd say oh you know he died from xyz but Correct. maybe that xyz was a secondary manifestation of cancer yeah manifestation yeah. of cancer um so what would your thoughts be mm. first of all um and particularly when you focus on 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 younger people i'll give you uh, an example um early uh, uh, mid ne- last year and uh, thankfully just to before i say anything else i alhamdulillah did not have cancer mm-hmm. uh, but middle of last year i saw my tongue uh, in the mirror and it was swollen to the extent that i could uh, it was swelling so fast ke hafte do hafte baad mein suffocate karna shuru ho jata wo itna zyada ho raha tha i went to a dentist the dentist said you need to get an mri this looks serious mm-hmm. i went to get the mri found out that there was a huge lesion or a huge growth of around this size sure. growing very very rapidly and um then i went to a, a, a interventional radiologist unhone iski blood supply ruki i went to my maxilla facial, facial surgeon unhone khair eventually puri zuban kaat ke um they ironically mera dhanda jo hai wo bol raha hai um and so there was a 50 50 off ke ji zuban hamesha ke liye khatam ho jayegi it was a tough time for me yeah. personally yeah. as well and वो जुबान उन्होंने पूरी काटी उन्होंने वो पूरा निकाला जाहिर है वो हाई नर्व एरिया तो वो के दरमियान में खुदा ही जानता है क्या स्नेप हुआ क्या नहीं हुआ तो पार्ट ऑफ माय टंग डाइड एज वेल एंड आई हैड टू रीडिजाइन माय एक्सेंट आई हैड टू रीडिजाइन द वे दैट आई ईट आई कांट सोलो थिंग्स प्रॉपर्ली दिस इज अ लॉट ऑफ लाइफस्टाइल चेंजेस दैट हैपेंड एंड मोर ऑफन देन नॉट आई 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 डू समटाइम्स थिंक बिकॉज़ इट इज अ इट इज अ वेरी रियल मतलब मुझे पता है कि उस टाइम के ऊपर जुबान को मैंने इतना जिसे कहते हैं ना टेक ऑन फॉर ग्रांटेड लिया और आज मुझे पता है कि वो कितनी इंपॉर्टेंट मसल रहा है कि मैं आई डू थिंक अबाउट यार आई वाज 32 इयर्स ओल्ड यू नो व्हाई डिड दिस हैपन टू मी आई मीन वाज इट द फूड दैट आई वाज ईटिंग वाज इट द माइक्रोप्लास्टिक्स वाज इट द दिस और द दैट एंड देन व्हेन आई लुक अराउंड यू नो आई आई फ्रेंड ऑफ माइन हैड अ ग्रोथ हेयर हैड हैड अ कपल ऑफ रिब्स रिमूव्ड अ फ्रेंड ऑफ अ कजन ऑफ माइन हैड एट द एज ऑफ 31 हैड अ हार्ट अटैक हैड पास्ड पास्ड अवे फॉर अ फ्यू सेकंड्स एंड दे हैड टू गेट रिससिटेटेड राइट and i don't know i mean does, did this happen to young people back mm. when you were young as well <laughs> or is this something that's a growing thing so the truth to this is that we don't have enough data to be able to answer this in a scientific way there's been very little formal collection of data on cancer in this country and in fact uh, at chokathanam i'm keep bringing that back unfortunately uh we founded uh, we we run the country's largest population based cancer registry is called the Punjab Cancer Registry and hospitals from all over the Punjab collaborate with us and we collect data that data is then extrapolated to represent pakistan data and in fact is even extrapolated to afghanistan so the who and stuff all uses that data so that data has only been around for about less than 20 years so we have no formal comparison to say give 50 60 mm growth kam hui yeah. kya hua right but the most likely thing that we we think is that two two things first of all people are living longer than they used to because the infectious diseases and so on that would kill children and babies are more curable and treatable now so as people grow to an older age they're more likely to manifest the illnesses of old age which include cancer so that's one reason the other is that there's increasing awareness again we feel we've contributed greatly to that with breast cancer awareness and so on but of course others have done that too it's a nationwide effort um so there's more awareness and more likelihood of people going to seek help earlier um more facilities available all over the country for things like mammography and x-rays and ct scans and so on so it's multifactorial but at the end of the day the data that we do have shows that in our country most of the common cancers tend to occur between 10 and 15 years younger than they do in the west really so our peak our peak incidence for breast cancer is in the early 40s 42 years is the average age uh, is the median for women presenting with breast cancer in this country 
In the West, it's over 50. It's 52 or 53. Would you, would you attribute that to environment or genetics or? A mix. Uh, so it's, um, for breast cancer in particular, it's things like the uh, age of menarche, the age in which you start having menstrual periods, the, the period of life for which you're having periods, your menopause, the number of pregnancies you have, then cousin marriages will accentuate this because there are some genetic abnormalities and your hamariyanto, mashallah, parents, grandparents, great sub-cousins, mm -hmm. so those things tend to accent, uh, potentiate themselves. Uh, there may be environmental factors too. We're not aware of those yet specifically. Um, lung cancer is on the increase because smoking took off here later than in the West. And, you know, there was a time when the tobacco companies in the West were saying they'll give cigarettes away for free in Asia and Africa. And they probably did. So, you know, we're just starting to see that. So uh, the crest of the wave there. It's not all the way there yet. Lung cancer is going to go up further. And this is West. It's going to be up there. Exactly. And it's going to be up there. Oral cavity cancer is increasing because of use of paan, chaliya, gutka, all this naswar, all these things. Right. So yes, cancer does occur at an earlier age. Uh, there are increasing numbers of patients, I think, because of survival from other diseases and because of better awareness, I think. Makes sense. And in terms of uh, treatment, has treatment evolved over the last 20 years? And in the coming time, particularly, I have this question because we also want to wrap up. I will tie it with another question, which is related to the age of AI. As the age mm -hmm. of AI is coming, there's a lot of conversation on sure. health tech. There's a lot of yeah. conversation on how AI <coughs> diagnosis may help karega. Um, how with AI and with precision technology, we're now, now at the cusp of that sort of moment where hardware has, has come to a point where precision is there, that a lot of different machines can work together, high-speed internet allows for mm. remote uh, management as well, sure. and autonomous uh, procedures are beginning to take shape mm. where human capability will go to a point that the precision is the surgeon, best surgeon in the world, is the machine which continuously um, radiology ko use karte hue, mm -hmm. wo identify karke. So, jo mujhe, again, I have to do it. So, uh, my surgeon ko is really, really good. I've had him on the podcast mm -hmm. as well after that. Sure. Unko bada fear hai tha, ki, yaar, mujhe to pata hi nahi hai, mujhe nahi pata nerve kaan se hai. human mm -hmm. error ho sakti hai, human sure. error ho sakti hai. Mm -hmm. Machines in, in that aspect can potentially uh, play a better role right. um, in, in, in being extremely precise. Yeah. Uh, so, this is a multi level question. Hai. Yes. But the question is, uh, ji, cancer treatment evolve kaise hoi hai? Cancer treatment aake wale, aane wale wakt mein kaise evolve ho rahi hai? Aur wider terms mein, um, AI and modern technology, how do you yeah. see the, the impact of those within your industry? Um, jis mein wo, uh, jo, jo clinical ya internal medicine ka kaam hai, wo kaafi hata kaise hai, kaise hai, wo shayad replace bhi ho jai. What do you okay. think? So yeah, <laughs> several <laughs> questions there. So cancer treatment has evolved beyond recognition. I mean, even when we were medical students, which is not that long ago, 35, 40 years ago, the mainstay of cancer treatment was what was called colloquially as slash and burn, which meant slash meant cut it out surgery. And surgery used to be mutilating, grotesque, you know, uh, for, for breast cancer surgery, for instance, they would remove the entire breast, the entire muscles of the chest wall, all the lymph nodes in the armpit, mutilating, devastating operation, you know, emotional trauma, the distress was just unbelievable. And burn meant radiation, irradiate. And radiation was very, you know, blunderbuss, it was like firing a shotgun, but just kill everything that moves there, which had tremendous side effects and so on. Surgery has become much more nuanced now. Uh, so increasingly, for instance, in breast cancer, you, today you treat with chemotherapy first to shrink the tumor, jo surgery ho, wo kam se kam ho, and as little, you know, long-term effects as possible. The smaller the incision, the better, and the smaller the volume of tissue you have to remove, and so on. Radiation has become immensely more accurate and targeted. We started with IMRT, where in front of the radiation beam, you would place these filters at various points so that the beam would be exactly the shape of the tumor, for instance, like the surrounding tissues bin then now we've advanced to the point where we can uh, incorporate the patient's breathing cycle into it. So that the breast, for instance, or a lung tumor, obviously when you're breathing, the, tumor, the lung moves and the, therefore the tumor moves too, but the beam is stationary. 
So what we now have is uh, inspiratory gating, respiratory gating, so that the machine can sense when the patient is breathing and when they've breathed out and the lung is still for a second, that's when the machine switches on, delivers the radiation mm. and then stops again as you start breathing. And, you know, these are just a few examples. So, but the, the real revolution in cancer treatment is with chemotherapy. Again, chemotherapy used to be very, very potent and toxic drugs which would kill the cancer cells, but would also kill all the other dividing cells, the blood cells, the hair, all the other. So, you know, you'd become intensely anemic and your white cells would drop and so on. So now we have more and more targeted therapy, which acts only on the cancer cells without damaging the other surrounding cells and the blood cells and the cells lining the gut and so on. So fewer side effects and greater efficacy in treating the tumor. Unfortunately, there's a huge cost associated with all of these. I mean, these are exponentially more expensive. And then we talked earlier about uh, individualized therapy for cancer. So for things like leukemia, they're now treated at the molecular level, blood cancers. And you can get designer drugs which are designed exclusively for, your, for you as a patient, which will target your specific genetic mutations and the clones of cells that you have and um, which can cost up upwards of a million dollars per patient. So, you know, that may be a far cry for us at the moment, but that's where cancer treatment is headed. And in terms of these treatments that are very expensive, both molecular yeah. and the earlier one mm. that you were talking about, do you think this, this cost is right now because it's early stage patents, mm. pharma companies right now, ensuring that the research cost yeah. is, but I mean, eventually will? Eventually it will. I mean, for the, for, the ta- for the targeted therapies, certainly that will happen as drugs go off patent and so on. But for the individualized therapies, I don't know when that will happen. I think that that may be a, a bridge too far, quite honestly, I'm not sure. In terms of artificial intelligence, that's very interesting, and obviously that's what everyone is talking about now. I get an email almost every day, either from a member of the board or from someone who's read an article about AI and how it links to healthcare. So the obvious things are diagnostics, and we're actually doing a number of research projects on this currently with universities in Pakistan as well as elsewhere uh, on... Um, the role of AI in imaging, so, you know, things like mammography, chest x-rays, where a a computer system would do an initial read, and if it's completely normal, then that's it. But if it, you know, based on the algorithm, whatever you teach it, obviously, uh, it will highlight the ones that need a second review by a physician. That's not quite ready for prime time yet, but that's certainly going to happen. Right. Similarly for biopsies and for... um, yeah, for histological specimens. So slides can be scanned electronically right. and then fed through a computer. Same thing, pattern recognition. So the computer would be able to then say, these are the ones that I think are completely normal. And then you do a quality check every tenth one or something of those. Um, and the, these are the ones that need a physician to look at them. Obviously, the decisions that result from this are potentially life-changing. So, you know, it's not something you would do lightly or as part of an experimental thing. Hmm. So I think the dust has yet to settle. There aren't any really widely accepted international guidelines on this at the moment. Um, But obviously, if AI develops to the point where we could have a robot instead of a foreign qualified doctor to see patients, then at least that might help solve our a lot of, uh, a lot of those brain problems. drain crisis. <laughs> In terms of the data that you guys have, and you have a huge bank of data, um, obviously with a lot of the, the work that <clears throat> AI requires is the data, right? So you, um, if I would, let's say, talk about, and I remember I saw a startup a couple of years ago, it was much before the AI LLM re- revolution, they were working on cancer diagnostics for breast cancer um, in Islamabad. And, uh, you know, again, using just sort of Im- imaging data, they were able to identify with a 93% accuracy whether this person right. has breast cancer or not. And mm-hmm. but I was simple to say that you need doctors, you need to see what you need to see. So now what do we do? We can take a van and take a look at people who across Pakistan breast cancer care at least as a step one, sure. at a very low cost, we can begin to find out. This is also a kind of research phase, mein hi hai, but mm-hmm. इस तरह की चीजों के लिए आपको डेटा चाहिए और ये डेटा पब्लिकली अवेलेबल नहीं है जिसमें आप कर सकते हैं तो अ लॉट ऑफ द मेडिकल डेटा इज स्टोर्ड इन दीस लॉकर्स इन हॉस्पिटल्स जिससे सॉल्यूशंस पोटेंशियली इमर्ज कर सकते हैं ये सॉल्यूशंस मेडिकल यूनिवर्सिटीज नहीं कर सकते इनके इसमें टेक के लोग हैं इसमें बायो इंजीनियर्स हैं 
तो ये जनरली स्टार्टअप कर रही हैं टेक कंपनीज कर रही हैं बट द टेक कंपनीज डोंट हैव द डेटा एंड द हॉस्पिटल्स डोंट हैव द टेक कैपेबिलिटी टू टू बी एबल टू डू इट कि आप चार इंजीनियर अपने हायर करें बट स्पेशलाइज्ड वर्क है तो इसमें हैव यू बीन एवर बीन रीच्ड आउट बाय बाय पार्टनर्स टू से कि लाइक वी कैन डू एन एमओयू विल इंश्योर द प्राइवेसी विल इंश्योर द सिक्योरिटी बट यू नो विल वर्क विद यू एंड इफ वी एबल टू क्रिएट समथिंग तो मे बी यू हैव डायरेक्ट सॉर्ट ऑफ राइट्स टू टू यूटिलाइज आवर टेक्नोलॉजी Yeah so well just to go back a little we you can do it with universities too and we are doing it not with medical universities okay. but with you know others technology universities and technological okay, okay. universities right. so we are and we're we're doing a number of projects with them at the current time we have also been approached a number of times by or, uh, commercial organizations which will you know throw you a little carrot okay well we'll give you something free for a month yeah if we get access to your entire radiology <laughs> database from 1994 onwards Uh, which we will download onto our service so it's gone <laughs> yeah so we're more careful about that obviously there are patient confidentiality and privacy issues but we also don't want to be research colonized you know we want to not so much that we want to get something for ourselves but we want there to be a technology transfer we want it to benefit the country as a whole taki hamare log bhi aage phir ye cheeze kar sake so we currently actually in negotiation with a company where something like this might happen that they will train some of our uh, engineers and others because we have quite a lot of computer type people to do our hospital information system um so that we can then develop this further locally so yes we are in negotiations with that's, that kind of that's exciting I'm, i'm looking forward to uh you know what you guys can do and particularly because in this area you can really emerge as a yeah. champion across the world mm. Um, and it's the way of the future i think there's no point burying your head in the sand this 100%, is going to happen 100% dr asim yusuf sir thank you so much for coming in thank you Thanks i'll be very honest me. um healthcare ki conversation se mai zara dur bhagta hu kyunki wo generally na uh, i'm i'm really sorry to say this to the community we generally bade boring log hote hain um very honestly this is one of the most favorite conversations i've had in a long long time and i've spoken to thank 280 you. thought leaders in pakistan um you're an you're an incredible conversationalist um but more than that i think this this i, I can't say this enough the, the 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 work that you but not just you your team all of the people who've come and gone who've, who've put in any work in it shaukat khanam is a world class institution it is it is one of the few things that in pakistan we pakistanis are incredibly proud of um something a badge that we can wear across the world and maybe some day even in mass as well <laughs> um but honestly that sort of pride that that institution has has given us thank you for your service thank you for to thank all you. of the people everyone from shaukat khanam who may be watching this thank you for your service to the nation to humanity i think this is not said enough um so i would like to thank you for that thank you and if there was one so. question that i ask all of my guests and i'd love your insight on that you've lived in the uk early on in your life you were in and out i'm sure you've traveled across the world you were in brazil once as well mm-hmm. how do you see pakistan of 2050 27 years from now knowing all of what you now seeing all of what you've seen over time um and i'd like for two things uh, within this question ek ek a lot of people tell me ke ye na ke matlab pakistan ki bahut badi youth population hai aur wo usko optimistically bolte hain youth population doesn't know anything it can be great it could be disastrous yes. you know um and dusra ye ke log kafi dafa kehte hain if and and they give me a vision of the future if such and such happen i want a, a vision of the future based on what you see right now and just extrapolating that the ifs yeah. may or may not come but uh, what are your thoughts so you know my view of pakistan hasn't really changed through my life or my adult life i've always felt that Pakistan is on an upward trajectory the angle at which it's going upward or not may vary but you know we're a very young nation i mean we we're always comparing ourselves with other people you know i think it wrong to compare us with europe or with america or or even with india i mean we're we're obsessed with this india they oh, they cover chand pe pahunch gaye or you know i mean they're a different country they've got a different trajectory to ours 70 75 years is nothing in the life of a nation we've had our ups and downs but if we look at where we were in his, what we read about where we were in 1947 or within our own lifetimes we talked about the late 70s the 80s the dearth of op- opportunity here you know i said you either became a doctor or you became a lawyer or um, an engineer or you were a failure you know that's how people presented it 
Now, there are so many career opportunities. Even today, with all the doom and gloom surrounding us, I think in the longer term, I don't see a problem. Yeah, short term, we're, uh, we're going through some difficulties right now. And maybe my experience at Chakatanam has only helped to res- reinforce this. But we've had some very bleak periods. You know, 1997, when Imran first fought the election, our donations fell through the floor because it coincided with the Ramzan season. And Imran famously had to sell his last plot to pay our salaries. And we thought, oh my God, you know, how, well, how's this going to work, you know? Pin 9-11 happened and we just couldn't recruit anyone from overseas and we couldn't, for a while, we couldn't go to the US to fundraise and so on. So there have been lots of ups and downs and that's mirrored in the history of our nation, I think, that there have been ups and downs and we may be going through some difficult times now. But I think that uh, this country has a great future I don't think that's going to manifest itself in the next five to ten years, but it's going to take longer. But I think the the future is bright. So you're largely optimistic. Absolutely. Sir, thank you so much for coming in. It's half full. (laughs) (laughs) Sir, thank you so much for coming in and sharing all that insight. Thank you. For all of you guys, thank you so much for watching. If you like this episode, you can share it with your friends. Please share it in the comment section. What are your thoughts on Chokot Khan and Pakistan's healthcare industry? Um, And generally about cancer, cancer treatment. Have you had uh, someone... Uh, close to you have cancer recently and if yes what uh, what all went through um, would like to hear about your experience um, this is the YouTube like button like button 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 audio platform sorry subscribe button 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 But anyways, this was Sayyid Muzamil Hassan Zaidi. You were watching Thought Behind Things. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.